<laughs> Dang. That's wild. <laughs> it's so cold. <laughs> so we work very closely with a variety of, you know, dozens of auto manufacturers to help them in the journey because we all need everyone driving electric. Our controllers are the same right now, which means across our product line. So it's the one co one software that is, you know, released and that goes to AC and DC chargers. Really? That's amazing. It actually, the controller boots up and detects what equipment is it on. Oh, and self-configures, not it, to go too far in the weeds, but most automakers can't do that. Yes. Like 99% of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. So this is our next generation AC product, the CP6000. Yeah, so, but these are, I believe these are 80 amp cables. Yep, they are. How fat, how long does it take to charge? And my answer is it takes me about two seconds. You don't have to worry about the torque and whether or not you got it in. You wow. put it in and you close it and it's done. Then, you know, if there's something wrong with the unit, if there's a thermal issue, we can spot those things ahead of time and then roll a truck to go fix that with the appropriate components on the truck to go fix it. Are so I think really understanding like what types of pricing structures really work well for drivers. And Everything beyond this top section, what we call a dry zone, mm -hmm. even though this is sealed, it's still all the electronics and everything. Certainly. It's not going to see any uh, ambient air transaction with the outside world. If you have a disconnect, an open connection at a solder joint, you have to really go in and see where in that solder joint you've had your failure. Hello and Ooh. welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me in the San Jose area where we are going to visit ChargePoint. If you own an electric car, it's very likely that you've charged at a charge point charger, whether it be a level two unit or a DC fast charger. We've been covering some of the deployment of their new Express Plus stations that are going around Colorado. It's all cool stuff. Uh, and basically they invited us over to go on a full tour. And that's what I wanna bring you guys on. We're gonna be meeting with engineers in their laboratories, looking at interoperability testing, looking at business cases. It's gonna be pretty freaking sweet. I don't know what to expect, but uh, just met some of the folks here at ChargePoint and they all, uh, you know, get it. They, they wanna hear what you guys think. So comment throughout the video with your impressions of what you're seeing throughout the thing, what you'd like ChargePoint to make or do differently or what you think they're doing great. So. Let's get into it. A whole visit here at ChargePoint. I'm so pumped. Well, guys, this is going to be a super long video. So just a little bit of warning in advance. Carve some time out of your day for this one because it's fascinating. If you're into electric cars, if you're into charging, I know it's a big two hour plus long video. Trust me, it's worth it. We went, uh, you know, we first started out, which you'll see, we talk a lot about the business case, charge point as a whole. We then talk about some of their level two units for home charging. We talk about their, you know, private and public level two chargers that we're all familiar with. We then get into the DC products, talking about up to one megawatt charging and even crazier installations than that. Um, we talk with their head of engineering. We go to where they actually try and destroy their chargers. We take a full tour of their reliability test laboratory, which was just amazing. And so it's really one of those crazy videos where we had the opportunity to go behind the scenes and share so much. But what's crazy is we only saw a small snippet of ChargePoint. So if you'd like more, if you have more questions, more things, um, let's do it. Just let us know what you want to see in the comments below. We got to go back because we're two hours into this video and it's still not everything, but I think you'll have your mind blown. Just the engineering of this stuff is truly incredible. So I'll leave chapters if there's sections you're more interested in. Honestly, my suggestion is get some popcorn and and plow through the whole thing because it's it's pretty crazy what you're about to see. And the access charge point gave us was just truly incredible. Everyone there was so nice. I have to say a huge thank you to the team for making this possible. And uh, can't wait to bring more crazy charging episodes to you soon. So thanks to charge point. Let's get into the full video strap in. It's going to be epic. Well, you guys join me inside the charge point building with Michael Hughes. Michael, how's it going? It's awesome. How are you doing, Kyle? Hey, doing well. Thank you so much for for having me and allowing our viewers to learn more about ChargePoint today. Yeah, we're excited to show you around the home of charging. So this <laughs> is going to be a fun day, so we're excited to have you here. Thank you so much. And we have the rest of the some ChargePoint team over here as well. So lots of fun to do. It's just me behind the camera. So uh, yeah, really excited to see what you guys have to share. Cool. So I'll, I'll do a couple things while we're here in the breezeway. Uh, one, introduce you to the company. So you know this industry really well, know us as a part of that. But it may not be obvious to you all the things that we're doing. So we're about an 1800 person company. You're at our headquarters. We've got a campus of four or five buildings here, two labs, 
and then engineering, product management, leadership of the company. Um, but 1,800 people around the world, development in, uh, on three continents, all of those things. And what we're doing is not always obvious to people. Of course, we make hardware, which everybody sees and understands. But I would argue we're really a software company, right? It's the software that enables that entire journey. We spend a ton of time, energy, and resource enabling drivers to have a great set of experiences, which we collectively agree is the, the is going to be critical for us to get over the hump. Absolutely. I mean, even just from a user experience standpoint, just being able to plug in a charge point unit, tap your credit card and go from like a basic standpoint is amazing. But then if you have a user account, you give the users all the data, charging curves, all the great stuff in there. We, we love the nerdy stuff. Yeah, so totally. it's really great. Totally. And so I'll, I won't bore you with this whole wall, but I'll say um, in general, we have people focus in all these different areas. And, and one of the ones I'll just point out is policy has been a really important piece. You couldn't even be in the charging business if it weren't for the policy team that we have that for 15 years has created the rules and regulations and enabled the electrification by state, in parking lots, all of that. So the policy team has made a huge difference for all of us to get to the business that we want to do that allow people to travel freely on electric. We've got an entire utilities team. Utilities really are an important partner for us in delivering uh, services to customers. Uh, this is also maybe not obvious, but we're open to all charging. So our belief is uh, it should be completely democratized and you should not have to pay extra. So through the ChargePoint app and from other apps, you can see all the stations, pricing, availability, all of that. So our idea is, and I think you share this, drivers should have an easy journey, should be very positive and seamless. When you need to charge, you need to charge. Absolutely. And one thing that I think ChargePoint does a really good job of from our standpoint as EV drivers is we get real time station status. We get pricing before we get there. We may not always agree with the pricing, but at least we know it and it's free market. We can choose not to plug in. Exactly. And there's two real business cases, right? There's, there's ChargePoint stations that you sell the unit to with a service contract where someone is managing that station or I should say owning the station. Right. And then we're starting to see more sites, especially by us in Colorado, that you guys own and operate. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's a really important nuance, right? So our business, we're a tech company. We're going to focus on building the best hardware, the best software, the best services that surround that to look, to deliver experiences to customers. Now, in the meantime, as grants land and opportunities to build out fast charging along, along highways, Sometimes site hosts are not ready for that investment, right? Whether they're a retailer, fuel and convenience or whatever it might be. In those cases, we'll step in and we will own, sometimes temporarily, in order to enable that market. But I think the broadest thing that I would say about how fast charging, public fast charging happens on highways and around, the site host has to be engaged in it. If the site host doesn't care that there's snow in front of it, or that it needs an awning because people are sweating out there in the summer sun, or that people are icing that station. If they're not engaged in that, they don't care, it doesn't really work that well. You can't manage remotely a bad set of customer experiences. And so our belief is that site host has to be engaged and part of that business, care about it, care about those customers that are using it. Really interesting. Now that's that's great to hear, and and we've seen examples of site hosts that really do care and go out of their way to make the best driver experience, and we've seen the opposite. And so it's all about finding those right partnerships, I guess, on your side. Yeah, and so so just to that end, and we won't dwell on this, but everything we do is to enable that customer, including the branding of the stations. We'll go outside in a minute. You'll see all the stations, and and we'll talk through it all day. But everything on that station is brandable for whoever that site host might be, the retailer, fuel and convenience company, whatever. And a lot of them do it because it's really to drive their business. And increasingly, I think we're seeing this recognition and then engage that customer, at least in the commercial fuel and convenience retail model, engage that customer to come in the store. I want to understand Kyle's outside. He's sitting in his vehicle. He hasn't come in and bought a burger. So how do I engage that customer and then integrate them in my loyalty program with all the other digital journey of the customer I have? Let's talk about that customer journey for a second. So you understand this really well, but we find that the customer generally lives in a home and when they leave the house in the morning, they're fully charged. Yep. And, in, and then they spend time going to the office and that office, like the facility out here, will have charging for them or should. And, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about fast charging on highways and that's exciting and everybody cares about it, but it's a very small percentage of the fuel that goes into a vehicle. And so 
if you have home charging and charging at the office, which is almost a mandate here in Silicon Valley anyway, with as many electric cars as there are here, you're solving 80, 90, 95% of your problem. Do you see the same? Yep, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's something we actually do, I think, a really bad job of covering is just how important level two charging is. Even just a wall outlet at an airport could be hugely helpful to an EV driver. And um, so going into sort of low power AC charging or low power DC charging is something we're getting more into um, because I think we have focused a bit too much on high power DC charging, even though that is still needed for corridor routes. So we totally agree. It's totally needed. And, and, and I think it helps with visibility for uh, pre-purchase behavior, say, oh, I, I can see charging on my way to grandma's house or whatever it might be, I feel good about it. But the truth is, everybody who drives an EV worries less about that than the folks that don't have EVs, because we know we're gonna get the charge at home, it's gonna have, I'm gonna have charging at the office. If I happen to go to the Warriors game tomorrow night, uh, I like charging at the stadium, Very nice. while I'm shopping, all of that, right? So this daily journey of the driver's different um, from what an ICE vehicle driver would think it is, it's really simple. You charge where you are. You don't go to get fuel. You fuel where you're sitting. And we spend most of our time sitting at home, office, maybe while shopping, maybe while watching a game. So you understand the, the, uh, the journey of the driver. It includes all of these locations. Yes. But we've invested a tremendous amount of money in and enable a, a, a singular experience across all of that. So from your app, you can find all these charging stations. If the stadium wants to give you a special service because you're a season ticket holder, they have the ability to set pricing and policy that allow that to occur. That occurs throughout this entire network. On those occasions that you go on a long journey, yes, you need fast charging on a highway, and we will enable that. And I think the government, the infrastructure bill helps us uh, uh, enable that. That's a little bit of the feeling and convenience folks that we were talking about earlier. So this entire journey, uh, is enabled through either the dash or through the phone, and we try to spend a lot of time doing that. But we're matching charging to the requirements of the customer how long they spend someplace. So everybody always asks before they buy an EV, how fat, how long does it take to charge? And my answer is it takes me about two seconds. Right, <laughs> right that's I, great. I land, I park, I plug it in, and then I go to work. So it's the wrong question because they don't understand the model. Absolutely. Totally agree. I mean, just the, the charging time is uh, really not a consideration in daily driving. Yeah. And so whether shopping mall, you know, they want to keep them there for a couple hours, great. Then you set up charging that is appropriate for that. Along the highway, of course, you're going to want it quickly. That's a different model. So, yeah, so I think understanding that we're matching the charging speed to the duration of that individual driver at that location, as should the apartments, the condos, the townhomes, the retailers, the, the libraries, all of the places we find charging. Totally agree. I think there's probably a, a, a case study out there somewhere, but for something like, you know, a hundred level two stations could remove the need for millions of dollars worth of DC fast chargers in that area. Exactly right. All right. So the one thing I haven't talked about is we're, our business from a high level. We, we, we spend time on commercial, which is all the things that we've talked about, feeling convenience, workplaces, municipalities, stadiums, all of the above. We spend time in fleet, which is buses, trucks, Uber, Lyft, Avis rental car, all of those folks. Um, and then we spend time with home. And so I wanna talk a little bit about home, but I'm gonna let our leader of the home business, Wendy, take us through that. So this is Wendy Wilson. Oh, great. And Wendy's gonna talk a little bit about our home offering. Hey, Wendy, how's it going? Hey, good. So glad that you're here, Kyle. Thank you. So we're gonna come over here. Sure. Talk about our home charger, CPH 50. I know I've seen you on your video with Tom Maloney. Yeah. So you're very familiar with this. Yes. Um, this is, this is something I'm very proud of. If this was clearly designed by people who live, drive, have lived and have driven electric for years, because there are so many thoughtful things that we've run into ourselves. I've driven electric for 11 years. And you don't realize 11 things. Years. 11 years. What were you driving? A, a leaf. Okay. I had a leaf with 85 miles of range, and <laughs> yeah. I loved it. It was yeah. so cute when you'd go in reverse. It would go beep, beep. Yep, beep. that's right. <laughs> that's so, amazing. I, I love it. And what do you have now? I have a Tesla. Oh, great. That's so, awesome. I have a Tesla. So it's great. I've, uh, we get to drive a lot of the cars that come here to get you know interoperability testing. Sure. And I have yet to drive an EV that I don't love. Amazing. So great it's to so hear. It's so much more fun than ICE vehicles. 
Yep. But I wanted to draw your attention. I know that you already knew some of these things. Like uh, Tom was really talking about how great our cables are. Yeah, he loves your cable. And yep. you're going to see when you go to our advanced test facility that we put it in like the super deep freezer at negative 50. <laughs> makes Tom's freezer look, uh, exactly. you know, like a Caribbean vacation. But it makes a big difference. It's not as big of a deal for people here in California, but I'm from central Illinois. And it is a big deal if your cable becomes very tight and hard to hard to manage. Absolutely. Um, there was also a question in that video about whether or not we do design this and we have people manufacture it because we have very specific, you know, specific things and we continue to iterate on it. Yeah, so it's your own design for your handles and everything and your own yes. cable, of course. And the cable. Yeah, that's exactly. really and, but, great. Almost no one's doing that in the charging industry. Everyone's buying off the shelf components. You guys spec this for your own needs. Exactly. So it's very important to us, you know, everything down to, you know, we're currently looking at at this because I know that there are sometimes people going in and out, there's clip issues. So yep. we're working on all of those. Great to hear. But, so with the swivel, that makes it a lot easier. Oh yeah, the let's take a look at that. Cable design, so yeah. you can do cable management. You don't have to have a separate cable management system. Um, all of this makes a lot of sense. But what people probably don't see is the stuff inside. So oh. I have one that's taken apart. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> So it's things like these Wego connectors. So these are very high quality industrial design. So your cable comes in, this cable attaches on this side with three, with three attachments. Yep. And then on this side is your, you can either hardwire it or you can use um, a NEMA connector and sure. it has three. And this just makes it a lot easier. You don't have to worry about the torque and whether or not you got it in. You wow. put it in and you close it and it's done. Never seen this from any other level two unit. Now I'm not really into reviewing level two units, so I'm not the most familiar exactly. with them. <laughs> but uh, as far as EVSEs go, these little things can really make a difference because speaking from my own experience, I, for example, have Tesla wall connectors in my garage mm -hmm. and the professional came to install it, didn't clamp down on the lugs enough and they just exploded for the second time which is crazy. Sorry to hear that. No, it's okay. The, the, you know, breakers did their job. Yeah. But with a solution like this, you can just be sure, and that's just speaking from my own experience, with a solution like this, you just clamp down the pressures there. Exactly. Well, and if you have a problem, because your NEMA connector, because I know that the receptacle, sometimes people haven't installed it correctly. Yes. Our station does that work. And then because this is removable, you can actually remove the cable remove you know sometimes people will drive over this yep. these are removable and they're field service replaceable so That's you can amazing. basically just replace this and not have to replace the whole unit really good so those stuff. are the types of things that we know that people drive over their cable because they forgot we know that that happens and so we're trying to make it so that you don't have to replace the whole unit super awesome and um just out of curiosity these units are purchasable from charge points website or how do people get those things we are trying to put them anywhere where people would want to buy them. So from when you're purchasing the vehicle, having the OEM offer it to you, to the dealership, to Amazon, to Best Buy, to Target, to Walmart, to our, to our own web store. Great, great to hear, that's awesome. So, so um, there are some other things like, you know, in the box, you'll see that it comes with the drill bit that you need. Oh, no way. It so comes it comes with, with the hardware. Yeah, it comes with all the hardware. So you don't have to go find it. You don't have to figure it out. Because no question, the, the unit is not the cheapest unit on the market. There's no way of putting it. And I'm not, I'm not Tom. I don't know the whole market landscape, but it seems to me that, you know, you're paying for quality, for engineering, for the better cable. And it's not like it's that much more than other units out there. That is exactly it. We want it to be the best experience because we know more drivers who have a great experience will tell other people and we'll get more people driving. That's great. That's really so, good. Everything to installation template. You don't have to think to nice little labels. Oh, like check these products. out. So you can say, hey, I've, I've, I have a lower amperage breaker right yep. there. That's amazing. And of course, the unit goes up to 48 amp output. Technically 50. Oh, 50. If you have a big enough. Yeah. So a 70 amp breaker, you can run 70 50. 70 amp breaker, you can run it at 50. You can, but it can flex from 16 up to 50. Oh, very nice. Uh, if you go over 40, though, you do need to hardwire. Right, of course, that's the limitation of the yeah. NEMA plug. But we've, uh, we also have a lot of viewers who have these units, and I see them comment from time to time, and they get great app analytics of their kilowatt hours outputted. Yes, and I can show that to you. Oh, great, good, good. It's in my list too. So one of the other things I love about our product is it actually integrates 
back to our whole conversation about how we partner with utilities, it integrates and you can enter in your util your specific utility. So I'm on PG&E and it'll say, oh, you know, this is the rate plan you're on. And it will tell me on my home charger, it'll show you, oh, I was plugged in last night at home for six hours and 32 minutes. It'll show you my charging curve and it'll show you exactly how much it cost me based on my PG&E um, right plan. Plan. And what's cool about the charger telling you how many kilowatt hours it's outputted rather than the car telling you how many kilowatt hours it's added to the battery pack is the car, or at least pretty much every car I can think of, doesn't account for losses. And so your, your price calculations aren't a hundred percent. Whereas this, this is telling you every bit of energy that flowed basically from this point right out of the unit where the meter is out of the cable. So your price calculations include the losses of charging the car. Exactly. Yeah. Everything. Very good stuff. So the last thing I wanted to show you is we do, this is just a, a nice little, uh, you know, pretty part on the front. And we do work with our manufacturer, you know, with some of our partners. So we have co-branded versions of this for people who want to show their, you know, excitement. And then I noticed on your website, and I did not do this early enough, that you had stickers. So, you know, we can have like <laughs> No this way. Too. We can have an out of spec branded charge point <laughs> charger. That's great. <laughs> so that was great. And do you have any other questions? No, that's good stuff. I, I know a lot of our viewers already use this unit as their daily one. So I'd love for them to actually chime in and say what they like and dislike about the unit. And I know Tom's a huge fan. I've never actually charged on one myself. So we should Maybe probably we change, change that. that. Yeah. We should probably change that. I think I know someone who can hook you up. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And and it just, you know, the thing I like about it from a visual standpoint is it's small, it's compact, it's definitely premium. Um, in my impression, just seeing these connection types right here, that's legit. That's well, really cool. And that's the stuff that people don't see if they're just looking at the outside and they're comparing the price. But what we're really trying to do is give the best quality, the best experience and a really thoughtful design. Well, I like it. Thanks so much for the tour. Really appreciate Thank it. You. I think you're going to go outside now. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> well, now you join us outside. We're over here by a level two public charging station. Well, actually, this is both private and public. Oh, interesting. So we're here, here in the charge point parking lot. Of course, uh, 600 ish employees here. And so all of us show up at work every day and want to charge, not surprisingly. So we have a series of these. This is the sort of workhorse of the product line for charge point. We've sold tens of thousands of these. This is the CT4000. 7.2 kilowatt charger, everybody shows up at the office, you identify themselves to the charger as easy as that. You get an audible click, unlock, plug in. As we said earlier, two seconds to, uh, to fuel, not four hours, not any number. And then I think the other part of that that will just make, make clear is, then I have it in my charge point app that my car is charging. And if I'm upstairs in a meeting, um, I know when I'm fully charged. And I know if somebody's on the wait list and Rebecca's waiting for me, it'll tell me, okay, move your car. And Rebecca will get a notification that says, oh, Michael's now moved his car, now I can go, now it's my turn, I'll go pull into that spot. So it's these software features that make it all useful for all of us who are here all day and not making charging part of our everyday duties. It's really cool. And you know, these units, I think everyone has charged on one of these. They're, yeah. they're literally everywhere across the entire country. Um, like you mentioned, the workhorses, they're fairly reliable. They're great. Uh, two questions on them because I see two issues out in the wild. Would love to hear your viewpoint on them. The first is, are you finding that your customers are looking for more power? They're 7.2 kilowatts. We're starting to see other brands come out with dual 80 amp outputs for some of the bigger trucks. Yeah. Is there some work to upgrade this to some more juicy power? You're absolutely right. So this, I think, fills the bulk of the use cases and the vehicles that will be serviced, and it's going to be a workhorse for many years to come. However, you are correct. An 80 amp charger is also required, and we'll show you that in just a minute. Oh, amazing. Very cool. A little tease. And then the second thing is, I'm just curious from the business case, occasionally we'll find these where maybe the service contract has run out or yeah. you know, with a broken clip and they're down for a year or two. Yeah. Ultimately, once these go to the site hosts that are hold holding the chargers, there's only so much charge point can do in my, you know, at least, you know, impression to actually get those units back online. Yep. What does that process look like? Yeah. So, uh, we will have our customers will have maintenance contracts and we'll help them through that and we'll roll trucks and fix problems as they occur. Um, we are working towards a, a more proactive approach to that. So especially in fast charging, this is really important. You know, if there's something wrong with the unit, if there's a thermal issue, we can spot those things ahead of time and then roll a truck to go fix that with the appropriate 
components on the truck to go fix it. So I think increasingly, and I think you would agree, to get to the availability that public charging requires, I, I know it's there, I know it's working, I know it's available. Um, we have to have a whole new level of service capability, which is not just, is it physically there? I got to look into that machine and understand, is, is it working? Are there any components that are heating up? Does it need fluid of any type? All of that stuff. And so increasingly, we think that's the standard that will be adopted going forward. That's great. To get where we all want to be. Yeah, from it's a quality so needed, especially having parts on a truck in the local area, ready to roll, you know, 24 hour response times. These are these are the future. Yep. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, so this is the AC world. I'll just make a put, point you around the parking lot and it'll be super hard to see on the video. But on the other side of this parking lot, of course, there's every known vehicle because everybody here at ChargePoint drives electric. Yeah, so your interoperability testing is just like <laughs> bring your car to work day. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But you'll see on the other side, this same configuration, uh, the same charger is available with what we call a tall boy for extended reach. Uh, there's a wall mount unit over there if it was stuck you know put in in a garage all of the same configuration and you'll see it across all our products it's effectively legos you can use it in every different use case very cool love to see it yep and so we'll walk through uh the dc side now and we'll get to fast charging here and as you can see we're under construction because this industry is moving fast <laughs> yeah. so we're under construction here uh sam and rebecca will take us through dc and we'll walk around to the other side and show you the fast charging on highways and fleet. Great. Thank you so much for that tour. You got hey, it. Sam. Hey, Rebecca. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you taking us through this. Yeah. So you'll probably recognize these units. You charge on them all the time. Absolutely. Um, the Express 250. And this is kind of our bread and butter DC product. Um, they do 125 kilowatts paired together. Um, you know, we sell these into quick serve, into uh, fueling and convenience. We sell them into fleet. And so this is a great product. Now you can see there's upgrades that are currently happening here and we're in the process of shuffling some things around and these units are actually going to move down there and we're going to put in the next generation of these units that upgrades the power to 160 kilowatts paired and upgrades the cables to 250 amps. So this will be in the similar shape to the CPE 250? Yeah, so this is going to be similar shape. We've upgraded cable management to kind of give a better, more consistent driver experience with our other DC products. Um, and it also shares a number of other components with DC products for better, you know, better on the host side. Um, and will they upgraded power modules as well? So upgraded power modules. Say, will you have a single option as well? Yeah. And will so, that be seventy-five kilowatts, or what will that be? So the it'll be eighty kilowatts um, in a single. Um, but most of our customers tend to pair them together to get that that increased output to one hundred and sixty. Um, and will it be Nevi compliant? So Nevi. It's no. 150 per 150 port. 150 is per port. Right. So you'd need a bunch of these, but we have, we'll talk, Rebecca's going to talk a lot about cool. kind of infrastructure bill and the rollout. She has a lot of experience with that. Well, I'm pleased to see the upgraded cable. I don't know if 250 amps is enough. We'll see out in the real world. We can do some math. Yeah, yeah. But uh, how, do, how do those conversations go internally? Because obviously you guys hear us complaining about the 200 amp cables on those. Maybe, you know, it's branded at 125 kilowatts on a 400 volt car. We're seeing, you know, 70 to 90 on a great day. Um, you know, you can roll up with an Ionic 5 and get, you know, pretty close to that 125. So, you know, not false advertising, just hard to communicate that to the the driver yeah what, what are you guys doing to really combat that problem yeah so I mean as far as we see it you know voltages in cars are increasing that's the general trend we see you know obviously 400 volt cars are gonna be here to stay but um, I drive a 800 volt car and I get you know full power out of these stations we're seeing more and more of those come out um, and still if you have a 400 volt vehicle and you want charge on one of these stations you'll still be able to get with the upgraded station you know 100 kilowatts of power certainly so you're you're able to get still to that upper level even with a lower voltage car yeah and a hundred's a lot more livable than 70 so exactly. we're we're pleased to see that for sure that's yeah. a nice upgrade so yeah. thanks for that tour appreciate yeah. it so we'll walk around and we can kind of show you some of the the conduit sticking out of the ground and what that means yeah um, and then we'll we'll get over to our express plus well this has got to be kind of fun to see dc installation going on right at the office because i'm sure you guys help a lot of sites across the country but being able to have it firsthand go check on it every day yeah. and watch the process this has got to be pretty cool no we there's always something going on here always something new coming in so we'll also be putting in new ac stations here i don't know if those are going to be our cp6000 or if we're just shifting down the cp6000 we'll go over there yeah but Bunch of shuffling going on here. I'm happy to see I'll be able to find a spot to charge. And the 6,000 will be how many amp output? So we'll talk about that. Um, it'll okay. be up to 80 amps. Oh, great. Good. So Juicy stuff. Yeah. We have um, 
Well, let's see if we can get you a good shot here of the conduit. Um, so this is where the 250s will move over to. Okay. Um, and you can see, <laughs> I think we walked by it. But, you know, coming up through the ground is our, you know, the AC input that runs into the power modules. And then there's also the DC to DC. There's the DC connection, the DC link between um, the, uh, the stations themselves for pairing. And that's kind of the cool thing about um, the CPE 250 and maybe the next generation stuff as well is that it's an all in one unit. Yeah. You know, for example, we're looking over here at the power cubes or the modules that power, you know, so super high power, power blocks. Power. Power blocks. So, Thank I'll get you. you the terminology yeah. yeah. No, appreciate that. Uh, but essentially the CPE 250s are, are an all in one. So you go AC connection right into the unit. But when you pair them together, do you have a DC bus between the two? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, okay. so there's a DC link underneath. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a space in, uh, use cases and in customer demand for both, you know, what we call monolithic charging. So you don't have a separate power conversion cabinet. You just have it all in one body. There's always a place for that, you know, whether that's constraints around, you know, how big, how much floor space you have or how much room in a parking lot, there's always a place for that. Um, but to get to that higher power today, we have, you know, our distributed systems. And we'll walk over here and I'll let Rebecca kind of take it away. Cool. And just to kind of leave our audience on one final thought of that monolithic charging strategy, you guys own that space. You have the best charger, the best all in one. It's quiet. They always work. And so, you know, you pretty much see a CPE 250, you know, you're going to get a charge. May not be the fastest thing, but you're going to charge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's really good stuff. But so, this looks cool. What the heck do we have going on over here? We've got a lot going on here, and I'll definitely get into kind of the fleet focused um, chargers we have here. But okay, I I've never even seen this before. I've never even seen what is going on up there before. A lot of wild stuff. <laughs> this is so cool. I'll introduce Rebecca here has a lot of experience rolling out DC uh, infrastructure projects, corridor, other things, and she's going to talk, give a little bit of intro on Express Plus. Thank you so much. Hey, Rebecca. Hey. So yeah, our team has a lot of experience building out these DC fast charging sites uh, across our network. And we do so by partnering with a lot of different site hosts. So we work with our fueling and convenience customers, with quick serve restaurant customers, retail, and many others. And really what we do is we help educate them on how they can integrate EV charging into their overall business model and really expand upon their portfolio of sites across their company's footprint. Um, so a lot of that to date has been through either utility funded programs or through state grant funded programs, um, much with the CP250. So um, that product we think has served our, all the vehicles on the road today very well, but really it's also provided a lot of valuable insights to our site hosts. Um, I know you're very familiar with the sites in Colorado. Yep, um, absolutely. Yeah, so that's <laughs> one example of that. Um, and some of the insights that those site hosts are able to get are really understanding like what types of pricing structures really work well for drivers and what's going to work for them going forward. What types of amenities really bring EV drivers into their property and also it helps them to understand, you know, what sites are getting the best utilization, where does it make sense to actually put charging stations and sites today and where maybe makes sense in two, three, five years from now. Yeah, so much thought has to be put into, you know, DC fast charging and from a cost standpoint, because things can get out of hand really quick yes. if you don't plan it properly. Exactly. And so it's great that you at least have the tools to help site hosts figure out like, maybe you should wait for a funding program in a couple of years, or let's put this thing in now. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. So that's why a lot of people have taken advantage of those grant funding programs to date. And we have a team internally that really helps to educate all of our site hosts on what those utility tariffs mean and really make sure that they know what they're getting themselves into. Um, but yeah, we really see a lot of value in actually partnering with these types of site hosts so that they can actually control the full customer experience. So it starts not only in the parking lot in terms of like putting the charging stations in a really safe and convenient location for drivers, but also brings them into their store. Um, they can bring them in with additional amenities and also just provides them like a really safe and convenient location to charge. Um, so moving forward, uh, this is our Express Plus solution, and we think this really, you know, is the right solution for that highway corridor type of charging. Um, I think that's the high speed charge that, you know, a lot of drivers are looking to expect at this point. Um, it, this is actually our Nevi kind of compliance uh, solution right here. So yeah. Express Plus will be what they will use to take advantage of that funding. And final assemblies in America? Uh, yes. Oh, so it's all by America yes. compliant, Nevi, the whole bit. That's exactly. great. Exactly. Yeah. And then this solution also just really helps those site hosts to future proof. So whether it's adding additional charging ports or it's adding additional capacity. So I'll hand it back to Sam and he can take you through. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So 
um, you can see a bunch of different components here. And so maybe starting over here. Yeah, let's take a look at this. A power block back there. And inside there are power modules. Each power module is 40 kilowatts. Okay. Same as, it's the exact same power module that goes into our CP250 and our CP280. Oh, is it really? And oh, that's so awesome. 280 really takes advantage of that full power up to 40 kilowatts. Okay. And so the shared modules offer another thing for site hosts. Say they have a bunch of different stations and they want to have on-site spares. Just one kind of power module for every DC station. Certainly. So basically they're in there in the center in a stack. I remember. Yeah. And you'll see online. inside. We'll, we'll open up a unit and you'll get oh, a tour cool. inside. So you'll get to, you'll get to check out kind of the beautiful architecture we've laid out. Great. Great. And a lot of our design has to, it focuses on, you know, good driver experience, but also, you know, uh, being able to support our stations in a in, uh, long term. But I'll talk a little bit about, so that's a 200 kilowatt block there running to this um, Express Plus uh, power link. So that's basically maxed out. You can go 200 kilowatt per brick. Yeah. So block, block sorry. There. <laughs> you got to get the yeah. terminology one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of, lot of power this, power that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this station here, uh, this has dry cables on it here, but um, this can do up to 200 kilowatts. Right. This one, that block actually has one less power module in it right now, so it's okay. only doing 160, 160. Right now. But I've never seen this handle before. What's what's going on yeah, here? So this is a new handle. It's under test right now, and this one is uh, designed by us. So that is cool. Big, beefy handle there. Yeah. Um, very reliable. <laughs> and and you said dry cable, non-water cooling. Yeah, so I thought you'd ask about that. Moving over to this station here, um, these are our liquid-cooled cables. Right. And um, you've seen these before at our site in Colorado. I yeah. Believe. Um, and this station is fed by two power blocks. So okay, both these of two. these feed into this station. So 200 kilowatts again each. Yeah. And so this station can do up to 400 kilowatts. Yep. Um, and it can charge simultaneously. So yep. so you'd get 350 maximum per car, let's just say, per yeah. port. No vehicle can do 400 kilowatts yet. Right. So but like Hummer EV would get maxed out. Theoretically, you yeah. could do 400. Okay. Um, and we've got... Two, two cables on here. Um, so if two vehicles pulled up, you're still pulling 200 each. And side. are these your own cable or do they come from a supplier or? We buy all, all cables come from a supplier. Okay, but the, yep. um, yeah, we selected these based off of, you know, best reliability, best you know, user experience. Totally there. love the handle on these things for sure, but I've never actually seen them charge point branded. That's pretty yeah. cool. So, I mean, the other thing is our cable management here. It's getting caught a little bit, but this cable management allows kind of great user, you know, it's really light. You know, you can move this around with one hand, you can plug in, offers great reach out to um, charge. And all of our stations come with cable management because it's really a priority for us, both from a user perspective, but also a reliability perspective. So the Express Plus is a unit we've been covering on our channel recently, and we've filmed with it. I think we were the first ones to film with it on YouTube yeah. at a public space. Yeah. And, uh, you know, super exciting because now we're finally getting that ease of user access, you know, that sort of tap your credit card or use your charge point app. You're getting the reliability that we know from CPE 250. And now it's coming to high power. Finally, you some juicy speeds. You know, you just tap on there. Oh, no way. I didn't know you could actually do that. That's so, awesome. <laughs> you can just plug in right now. Yeah, that's great. Um, this is pretty cool. Now, we've seen a few different configurations of these from dual CCS to single CCS to CCS and Chatamo. What are you finding most people are installing? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, it depends on the use case. So this is a product that can be not just for commercial, which we've talked a lot about, but also for fleet. And so you can see a bunch of different stations here that I'll get into a little bit. But um, it depends on what application, what power level they're going for. Obviously, a dual cable station is probably the best, you know, you know, value for most customers if they're going to be charging multiple vehicles. And you can do simultaneous charging off of one dispenser. Yes, you can do simultaneous. In some fleet applications, um, you know, it makes more sense to do sequential because they're just charging overnight. Absolutely. Um, but this, the, the way that we've designed our system is, you know, for scaling and it, you can scale in multiple ways. Um, let's say you start with a certain vehicle today and you've got, you know, lower power. And over time, you buy another vehicle that goes to higher power. You can add another power block you can have more power modules into one power block. Right. And so you can scale power to, you can scale power, but you can also scale ports. So you could start out your site with, you know, two power blocks, one power link, and you wire it in, you know, knowing that in the future you might add another power link. And so you've scaled your ports without scaling the power. Right, very interesting uh, there. And and basically what we've seen uh, just in Estes Park, Colorado, we were at a recent station, you had two uh, power blocks with 160 kilowatts each. Yeah. And so they both were sort of missing that fourth, uh, you know, yeah. sort of power converter in there. And that's, that's about the modularity. If the customer only needs 160 kilowatts, 
they can just not put in that last module. Certainly. Um, and, you know, cheaper. But they, uh, if they want that power eventually, they can always slide one in. Right. And a lot of it comes down to the cables they select as well, right? Because if you're not going to go liquid cooled cables, it may not make sense to go 500 amp output capability. You may just actually financially just remove a brick or two from those things. Yeah. A power. What do you actually call those again? Uh, the, power the, modules. Power modules. So okay. So it's not power like modules inside power blocks feeding power links. Okay. So, <laughs> a lot of power. A lot of power. Um, but yeah. So other stuff I'll kind of walk you through. Yeah. Here. What's um, going on over here? This looks like a half a one. Yeah, so this is our one of our fleet dispensers. And so this is a power link um, and it is wall mounted here. And you can see it's missing the bottom half because that's normally where the conduits come up, but you can see they're coming up right here. Um, now this station, the cables um, are still tied up at the back. It's not sure. operational yet, yep. it's got installed. But um, the station eventually will have a cable management system. And this is kind of designed more for fleet applications. This is not something you would see, you know, in a public application. Um, but this could be used by fleets, you know, push all the stations on the wall, clear up floor space, install many more than they, um, you know, than you would be able to with just a pedestal based station. And this will be linked to those over there. Yeah. So, okay. more on that, but these stations actually, so there's another one up there. So that's a that charger one, up there or a dispenser more or less? That's a power link. Okay. And so you can see just how compact it is and there's no display on it. Um, it's able to, it'll have uh, cables installed eventually. So those are, all this just got installed recently. So still missing some parts, but the, um, when the cables are there, they can be managed by uh, overhead cable management. Oh, great. And so imagine a fleet scenario where you don't have floor space, you're, a, you know, depot for delivery trucks or buses. You want to just put everything overhead. Yeah. Really great solution there. That is so sick. I'm trying to think. I recently saw an overhead charging solution. It was actually end of line at Rivian yeah. where the trucks are being manufactured. So they pull them all out. They pull a cable down and, and go. But how would you actually activate that station if it's all the way up there? Would you do plug and charge or what so would you do? So most of our fleet customers, they don't need authentication on their stations. They sure. just charge because they want their, their drivers to just pull up, plug in. And so they don't do any authentication. Obviously, we can do plug and charge as well. So when we get to that point where um, they want to do authentication, that'll be over uh, plug and charge. That is so cool. I actually can't wait to see the first public install of that. I know it's not really meant for it, but that would be so cool if you have plug and charge enabled on a charge point network to just roll up and overhead charge a car. That would be sick. There's a lot of applications we're thinking about. So it, and this is all enabled by kind of the modular architecture that we built here with Express Plus. This is cool. And what a neat display you have. You basically have all the different ways that you can do this. Now, I have one last question, which is, is it possible to host up a CPE 250 without chargers inside of it as a dispenser. Have I seen that before? No. So okay. That's, that, that's kind of what this is basically. Yeah, so certainly. Is, yeah. So this is all the power conversion is done in the power block. Yeah. Feeds DC connection into the power. Line. So anytime you have an existing, let's say you have existing CPE 250 sites, yeah. if you want to upgrade to the power blocks, those come out and you install these dispensers here. Yeah. And one thing we've thought about is uh, backwards compatibility in our in actually the uh, the pads that we built. So the this shares the same concrete pad as our power link, as our uh, CPU 250s. Oh, very good. Oftentimes, you know, you need to upsize the conduit, but if you're putting in stations today and you're forward thinking enough, yep. you would size that conduit for, you know, some of our other stations. So oh, that's very um, cool. Now, the last thing I'll say here, so these two stations are fed by these power blocks here. And in the middle is a distribution cabinet that allows us to feed multiple stations, including in the future, where they're tearing up the ground over there, there will be actually a pantograph. And so pantographs are used for uh, charging buses. It's an overhead charger. Oh, cool. Industrial fleet charger. Um, and so we're gonna have a mast there with a power link and a pantograph. And then like some Nissan Leaf that's hacked together to charge on that thing. <laughs> well, so the big thing about this site is that it's a, it's an interoperability site first and foremost. Like we have vehicles here all the time. Um, you know, we have school buses and delivery trucks and we have, you know, next generation secret vehicles and camouflage. Sure. We're coming here to test and make sure their vehicles work. And so by opening it up to the fleet side of things, we can enable that even more. That is so cool. What a neat display. Thank you so much for showing us this. Yeah. And you got, of course, a cool F-150 Lightning doing some testing over yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just really cool. This is fascinating. I didn't know that was in the works to have that above ground or overhead charging solution. Yeah. That is that is cool. Yeah, pretty sweet. And so how many dispensers in theory could you have linked up to two cabinets? Because you, you mentioned that you have your distribution box there. Yeah, so um, I think the total number of would be 
eight dispensers, but you could have dual cables on each. And obviously with a distribution cabinet, it, you know, it, that's sequential charging. Off of one of the power blocks, and this is actually something I wanted to talk about, one power block, it has two outputs. So imagine you had two vehicles pull up to the uh, power link over here, and one plugs in first, and it gets as many power modules as it needs. Now, uh, so let's say it's charging at 200 kilo, or it's charging at 250 kilowatts. So it's taking, you know, five modules out of that side and three modules out of this side. Now, another vehicle pl uh, comes up and it plugs in and it can only get the modules that are left over. Sure. Now, as the first vehicle ramps down, it can give module after module over and it's switching granularity is at the module level, not at the block level. Right, that's great. So, so you can go in 40 kilowatt bricks, you can transfer power to any vehicle, exactly. but is there also a force split option that you could yeah. set it up? That would be up to the CPO, whoever's running exactly. the, the site. So we offer, you know, we offer that that option and it's set up, it's configurable. You can always change it later. Yeah, but dynamic charging is the way to do it for public is as one car ramps down, give the extra to the next. Exactly. And that dynamic charging at the module level is really a differentiator we see because oftentimes um, some of the cabinets, they can only do one output at a time. So you're switching at the cabinet level. Absolutely. So. We won't name names, but we know who. Um, also, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this is pretty interesting. In theory, if you had two power blocks, with how many dispensers? You go up to four dispensers on that power links. Is that what those are? Yes, yeah, so you could do four outputs. And so that could either okay. be in... Um, so is that eight cars with dual output each? Well, it depends. So uh, you could do... This is fed by two outputs. So that's technically, because it can uh, charge simultaneously, that's like two outputs in, in one. Okay, I see. I so see. if you yep. have simultaneous, you could do two dispensers with four outputs off of those. Okay, makes um, sense. That makes sense for a parking lot space yeah. and everything. But in a fleet situation, if you're only charging sequentially, you could do many more parking spaces served, but they charge sequentially. Right, so sequentially would be this solution here where you could have you know a whole row of these things yeah. and it would just charge one after another, basically. You, you know, you could charge up to eight parking spaces without the distribution cabinet if you have two blocks. So. That's very cool, yeah. That, this is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll walk inside now, I think. Um, and oh, yeah. I let's almost forgot. let's do the 6,000. Yeah. So what the F-150 is charging on right now, and obviously this vehicle can do 80 amps. Yeah, the F-150 is 80 amp compatible. Yeah. So this is our next generation AC product, the CP6000. And um, this one, I think, is set up... Uh, it can do up to 17 kilowatts right now. Certainly, because you're probably at 208 volts or so. Yeah, yeah. So, but these are, I believe these are 80 amp cables. Yep, they are. Feel nice. Feel chunky. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, these things are, they're still not bad though compared to other 80 amp cables no, I've, very I've seen. Light, very flexible. Um, and we have great cable management here that allows extended reach out. You know, these big vehicles, you know, that's an increasing concern is, you know, they put the charge port way back there. We need to make sure we think about our cable management being able to accommodate that. Other things I'll talk about here is, you know, we've got new um, cable design here that allows kind of LED indication of what's happening on each side. Oh, interesting. So this one's green indicating charging or fully charged? Indicating this one's available. And then this oh, is why I say flashing. And so across our products, that same, uh, that same kind of UI exists. So on our DC products, that pulsing blue is indication of charging. Okay. Um, and the other thing I'll note here is that this display is the exact same one that's in our DC product. Oh, so interesting. If you're a site host, these are the same part. They're the same control module um, and they allow you to kind of share parts. You know, say you have to uh, have spares on site, you only have one spare for AC and DC. Bill, how's it going, sir? It's going great. Welcome to ChargePoint. Hey, thanks for having us. And so now things get real. This is where we go inside the labs. That's right. You want to see where the magic happens? I would love to. All right, let's go inside. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, what a cool display out here, by the way. This is just so sick. So, Bill, what's your responsibility at ChargePoint? I lead the product organization. That's everything from how we think about how best to serve our commercial fleet and residential customers the use cases they're designing for, the driver experience aspects, the uh, host needs and how it aligns to their business goals and business models, even their business systems. And so managing this at scale, deploying this for their business goal, um, it's, it's all about how can we help them integrate it to the systems that they run on, so where you are right now... I mean, we could already spend an hour just on oh, all the stuff we just passed. That was crazy. <laughs> okay. well, we're going to bring you inside here in a second. Oh my gosh, look at this. Crazy. So you're in really the birthplace of EV charging. ChargePoint's been doing this since 2007. We're 
you know, fanatic and obsessive about moving all goods and people on electric power. And we, a lot of people don't realize the passion around this experience is the end-to-end -end journey of the driver, the host, and it takes a lot of innovation. So we're going to take you into the charge point garage, like everything in Silicon Valley, a lot of inspiration, innovation, and uh, world-changing experiences get created in the garage. And so we're going to take you there. Amazing. You behind me, just a, a snippet of the innovations that's happened inside of this company from the beginning. Very uh, perceptive forth forethought leadership that started this company in 2007, realizing it needed a networked, software-backed charging experience to manage at scale. It needed world-class hardware that was under the the purposes of the host that was deploying it. And it needed a, a design architecturally to scale for what the world needs in terms of the number of chargers we all know, know we need to deploy, whether it's AC or DC. So let's go in the garage. Yeah, this is crazy here. Oh my gosh. Can't say I've ever seen a garage that looks as cool as this. And we do want to start with the driver experience first, and then we'll get to what the infrastructure design and how we kind of, everything's intentional that we do. And so starting with the driver is critically important. So you mentioned before about the mobile app and that experience. We do a lot inside of the vehicle itself with auto manufacturers. So let's go inside this Mercedes EQE. Yeah, let's go check this thing out. This is one of your colleagues' cars. That's what right. happens to be here. That's awesome. So we'll do a little unlock situation and we're in. And I'll put uh, you guys in the back seat. Is that where uh, camera should go, do you think? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So right this way, audience. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. So we work very closely with a variety of, you know, dozens of auto manufacturers to help them in the journey because we all need everyone driving electric. And uh, we mentioned before that we interoperate with many, many roaming networks. So with your charge point credentials, you can register, authenticate, have a session on an EVgo network, on a flow network, and all that billing happens in the background. The user doesn't have to have another account to access those stations. So Mercedes has deeply integrated this with our technology underneath what we call the driver experience network. And this is the Mercedes me experience. So, hey, Mercedes, navigate to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Route guidance to Monterey Bay Aquarium, 886 Cannery Row, Monterey, California is starting. So they ask me if I want the carpooling, I'll say no. They'll show me all, if I go into the details, they'll show me all the charging stations along the route. And that exposes all the ones that we interoperate with and are enabled for Mercedes. So whether that's 125 kilowatt charge point to a six kilowatt, to an EVgo station, to an Electrify America station, you saw right there possibly. Um, we make it all possible, and then Mercedes is doing the route planning based on where you are to navigate to. So they're choosing the highest power station that they can operate with the most conveniently off the highway, I imagine, for their customer. And they know the state of charge of the vehicle. Yep. Right? And back in January of 2023, Mercedes at ChargePoint and another company called Emanate announced the formation of the Mercedes high-speed charging network across North America. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that seems pretty nifty. Right, so we have a long-standing relationship with Mercedes. Um, and uh, really raising the bar of experience for EV drivers. This is one example of this. The experience that they're creating is really pairing what are the right environments for EV charging to happen? What are the amenities that someone should have while they're making their route uh, from you know the city to the lake or to the mountains? And how can we raise the bar again? And so what we're doing together is deeper integrations between the driver experience in the dash, the cloud, and the station experience. So what's really important about ChargePoint to understand is we're a technology company. We look like we focus a lot on hardware, and we do, but hardware is a, is a, is a, is a system ingredient of a total software solution. So we write the code on our mobile app. We provide the software backbone that enables the experience for our in-dash partners. We write the CPO software in the cloud that the hosts use that administrates the policy on those stations. And for a driver of this group, maybe it's an employee and they get free charging. Maybe it's a specific auto OEM on a specific network and they get a, a favorable rate. 
Uh, maybe it's a Mercedes driver going to a Mercedes station and there's special privileges. That network is going to serve all drivers in North America. So that network everyone can plug into. Everyone can plug into, but um, yeah, we're Mercedes working plus. Mercedes might be a little bit better. Mercedes <laughs> uh, will have uh, the in-dash experience with that station, including the ability to reserve ahead. That will be really interesting to see how that works in practice. Because we've never seen it at mass scale. I mean, EVGO's kind of played around with um, with reserving stations, so I'm really curious to see how, it, how that works out. That's right. And so we've worked a lot with them. They have obviously world-class designers in terms of user experience, as does ChargePoint. And so uh, it's, you know, it's raising the bar again for the industry. And that's, that's why we're so glad you're here to see this. Yeah, pretty cool. Well, this is great to see. I think a lot of our audience who maybe own newer vehicles see something like this. That's right. Mercedes, though, and not that like this is, this is not a Mercedes ad at all. This car just happened to be here. They have great route planning. And... Um, that's, that's the one thing I always give them props for. They precondition the battery on the way to a charger. They're doing as much as they can to get the car set up to work with that charging station. Sounds like more is even going to happen when they start having their own stations out there in partnership with you guys. Yeah, so that's an dimension to it. And so um, you're... How can I help? <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> um, another dimension to this is that software linkage for the driver wherever they are. And so... Uh, with the mobile app on your iOS or Android device. Uh, that will plug in if you have CarPlay or Android Auto in your vehicle, that all interoperates today. You'll see other vehicles uh, that we have created in-dash experiences for also further in the day today. Very cool. Um, and that also kind of goes back to the home unit. So if we step outside for yeah. a second. So now you've arrived home, you had a really cool Volvo Plus Air One. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I brought the Pulsar one. <laughs> yes, it's back in Colorado. And the the mobile app experience incorporates the home charger as well. And so if I'm a Mercedes vehicle owner, pulling into my Mercedes home charger will show up in my dashboard. Right, so they'll have their own faceplate as an example. Right. And in the mobile app, right, and just for a ChargePoint home user, uh, we plug in. Uh, you guys got to come look at this really quick, just because you're here. Look at how many chargers are around in this area. It's just so many. So what's really important about the home experience in the mobile is scheduled charging to take advantage of lowest energy cost. I think your, your viewers know that very well, but also tying it into the rest of my life. So I can check on my, my screen here. If I go over to my widgets, there's a bunch of charge point widgets that show me available stations nearby, my specific home charger. My char car is actually charging in the parking lot right now. Very nice, ran it low. <laughs> oh, maybe not, was that just you've added 32 I've miles? I've added 32 oh, miles, so 32 far. miles yeah. range, okay. And so tying this into the, daily, the, the driver's daily journey, yeah. critically important, it's backed by software. You saw it in the vehicle, you see it here. It connects to my Alexa at home. And now let's talk about how software powers the architecture that is supported by all the hardware we're going to show. Yeah, very cool. This is pretty neat stuff. Also, just being in the lab. Yeah, so this Hossein, is crazy. <laughs> one, Hossein Kazemi is our head of engineering. And describe this, this lab as a very special place. Yes. So, yeah, this is one of our seven labs. It's our uh, second interop lab that is this large. This, uh, this lab has 4,000 amp coming into it. You can see the number up there. 4, yes, 4,000 amp. So we have eight stations we can run full power to, to megawatts of charging here. We can test in this yeah. facility. Amazing. Multiple vehicles. How power. do you drain the batteries once you're done charging them? You just uh, gotta go out and drive a lot? We yeah. have been very creative on that. You know, yeah. that's a very good question. We have heater some on, of them. Yeah, heater on, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Fans on, lights on. Yep. We actually, the cars actually help too because you can turn the heater on one side and, and chiller on the other side. Oh, that's <laughs> And hard. then it just... Genius, I've never tried that. <laughs> I've always just left it with the heater, but I'm like, heat pump cars, you know, you only get that initial help. Yes. But if you run them both, yes. thank you. You <laughs> saved me like a day. <laughs> that helps a lot. So yeah, so we, we, we have uh, cars that we bring in. Any car that is new in the market, actually, the, we have uh, relationships with the with the OEMs, and then they bring the vehicles here before it's released, and then we do interop testing here. Yeah, very cool. Facility. And I can see um, some load banks, some stuff that you have around to yes, do round trip have, charger yeah, testing. Yeah, bi-directional DC, you know, yep. kind of um, active loads. We have, uh, we have, we can bring actually trucks into the other interop lab, large oh, wow. trucks, and uh, you know, doing our ability testing. Yeah, we're doing yard tractors, a lot of things around yeah. fleets that 
you wouldn't necessarily know as vehicles that are used to move containers around in a yard. There's Very a lot of electrification of ports uh, and obviously fleet vehicles that are critical in the transition to electric right. fuel. Very cool. Very cool. So you can see we have multiple uh, equipment here that can simulate the interop uh, for different protocols. Could you walk us through everything we're looking at here? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, you can see multiple equipment. We have obviously a lot of equipment that are open, you know, from old generation, new generation products. Yeah. Uh, these are equipment we use for interoperability testing. Yep. These are they come certified from the from the manufacturers. All the timings and sequencing is defined. You can actually see a packet by packet transaction, pulse by pulse to see what goes in between the vehicle and the Certainly, yeah, um, and, and we're familiar with, with this company as well from the yes. suitcase charge testers that they have exactly. out there and some other things, yeah. We have our own tool, we have the portable ones, we can actually take oh, to, yeah. the, take to the, you know, field. I know, they charge the point specific ones? Yes. Oh, very it's cool. It's all designed, so we have the mobile ones. And can we, we have, open one up? Can we see that? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, well, before well, we leave, let's, open, uh, yes. yeah, let's do so that. Have them open and then we can take a look at them later. Great. So, yeah, we have homemade ones. Actually, we have two types of homemade ones. One is portable, one is non-portable. Oh, cool. The one that is not portable is there. We can look at it later. Great. But, yeah, so you can see here that we have multiple stations here. Uh, so, we do, uh, when we release a new software, we have regression testing happening here for uh, months before we release that into the process. So, you basically have every generation of That's charger correct. hardware. Absolutely. So, when the new software goes on, this is over the air update capable yes and you would let the site host know saying yes. hey we're doing this do you store the previous version of the software on the unit so if it doesn't work you can go yes. back yes so uh, yes that's it that's actually a big topic i wanted to touch on so uh, i mean you heard you know before our controllers are the same right now it's been across our product line so it's the one co one software that is you know released and that goes to ac and dc charges really that's amazing. Yeah, actually, the controller boots up and detects what equipment is it on. Oh, and self-configures. It, it actually loads code, firmware, and software and all the boards that have chips inside the, inside the dispenser. Amazing. And power block before it starts operating. So but that's pretty much unheard of in this industry. And that's because you guys created all the hardware yes. with the software. Yes. No, no one else can do that. That's yes. crazy. Exactly. So what we have done is that we have, we have made a hardware platform to match to the software platform we have. We have actually the capability to remotely reboot each and every one of the boards independently by themselves. Oh, really? So we have we have built in a lot of capability to make sure that we have full control over different aspects of the charger. That's amazing. I would have never guessed that. I mean, that's yeah. like, you know, not to go too far in the weeds, but most automakers can't do that. Yes. Like 99% of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Yes, so we do a lot of regression testing, and then the second phase is it goes outside to the friendly sites or other stations outside. Mm -hmm. So we expose them to public, and then there's regression testing period that we go through before it goes to global. So let's say you, you want to do a new software update. How, how long does that take from idea to creating the software to roll out? Is that a six month process? But right now we are on a six month cadence. Okay. So we have emergency releases if it's needed, but we are on a six month cadence. Oh, so very cool. Yeah. And what, what features would you improve? Are you improving efficiency through software of certain components or? All sorts of uh, improvements, right? So think about it, right? Because again, we are releasing one software for everything. So even if you have a new product, the new software that runs a new product is the same software that runs on the old product. So, yeah, this is crazy. So it's it's gonna be it's gonna be deployed everywhere. So, wow. so we have new features, we have improvements, we have constant you know uh, improvements that we do to, to the product. That's the most impressive thing I've heard in yeah. like a month or more. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. So yeah, you can see that the, that's this here, and then you can go on the other side, and I can show you. Yeah. Let's see what we got going on over here. Some of the plat hardware platform, you know, what do we what do we mean by hardware platform and how does it work? Yeah. So let's just start with the the heart of the product, which is the power module. Okay, great. That's so interesting to see. This is our power module. It's a fully enclosed sealed unit. Uh, actually, we can submerge this for 48 hours in the water. Oh, really? Yeah, because we have, if you notice, we have 18 inch clearance for all of our products right now. Right. So if there's flooding, it's not going to impact the operation of the system. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah, this this goes horizontally in, in power block, but it goes vertically in our CPE 250, 280. So basically, in every CPE 250, you have two right. of these or the 280 now. Exactly. So these. it actually breaches into the 18-inch clearance, so we had to design it so it's waterproof. Wow. So to comply with that requirements. And 
Did you upgrade this power module to bring it from a 250 to a 280? Excellent question. So it, it, it's, it, it, again, that's another aspect of you know what we do. This is this module supports all the 250s. You can actually put this inside the 250s at seamless right, integration. Yeah. Uh, it just the improve the power, improve the efficiency. So it's more power. Um, you know, from 31.25 to 40 kilowatts. If this is a 40 kilowatt, mm -hmm. and uh, what is in fact, what's compatible, we can put it in CP250. Oh, wow, cool. That's so the awesome. same power module, we designed one conversion that goes into monolithic chargers uh, or power blocks up to megawatts. Wow. So yeah. it, it's the same product. So we we have put a lot of effort to make this uh, reliable, uh, high lifetime, high cycle time. Well, um, and that's been proven out in the wild too, yes. because you've had CPE 250s for years exactly. now. And as I was talking to some of your colleagues too, it's like, you may not get the fastest charging. Certainly right. that's Express Plus's job but it's always going to work. <laughs> and yes. that's, the, that's the thing that yes. is really important to us as EV drivers. I mean, you're going to see our reliability lab, but we have a lot of design and philosophies into how we design a, anything, the power conversion of board. So 40 kilowatt. Then from here, we go to power blocks. I mean, you, you are familiar with the CP250. Two yep. of these goes in there. Yep. Uh, five of those goes into our power blocks. Right, so if you guys take a look just over in here, you'll see you can, those shelves that they slide into. And how do they actually connect up? What do the ports look like? Actually, let's just come back here because it's, uh, I want to show you that before sure. we... Let me just turn this around. So this is, you can change a power module in our unit in less than 20 minutes. There is no uh, the skills required to change that. Oh, wow. You move the cover, uh, you know, the bus bars are one, just, you know, they, they get connected and disconnected with push move and pull move. Oh, so there's not even like a latch, it's just, it just pressure There's a latch in. on the unit that actually okay. latches, the, the, the holds it, and you have to release it to pull it back out. I'll show you actually how it Wait, works. No crimping, no like up Nothing. to the, because yes. what you really don't want to have is like maybe a, an unskilled technician or someone who's rushing that's who correct. doesn't crimp one down hard enough. Yes, and that's the intention, and that philosophy actually goes to the rest of the system that I'm going to talk about. But the power module, you can see three connections for AC, yep. two DC outputs, the communication, and actually the liquid, we are water cooled, our systems are water cooled. Yep. And even the water cooled quick disconnect, you don't need to go. Oh, really? It. it just, yeah, it mates and, you know, this joints, you know, and then you can put a new one. That is so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, so I think if you look at the now, let's go. So this, this here, you know, you, you know, here you can see actually inside and how it actually mates uh, to the, to the, to the back of the unit. Wow. So that is that is how you change it, you know, that, that's uptime, right? So you what I'm going to do is get a couple of these, carry them in the back of my Rivian. So if I show up to one that's not a 200 kilowatt, I'll just pop my own. In. Yes, <laughs> so yes. That's amazing. That's it's really it's cool. that simple, actually. Yeah, I mean, wow. people don't realize, but it is that simple. And there's, you know, carpet that comes off and then you have access to this. And then all of the like PLC communication, all that stuff's done on the dispenser side, yeah, right? So so this is our, so the, obviously we, the, the dispenser is decoupled from the power cabinet, right? Yes. So the power cabinet has a power management board. Okay. But all the communication to the vehicle, you know, the decisions of how much power goes to what ports and yeah. what vehicle, that comes through the main controller that I'm going to talk about. But this okay. cabinet, it only manages the cooling system and the, the power, uh, how much power goes to which bus bar. Right. And so you can do, you can cool the sub ambient with a chiller. So we don't have a chiller. That's okay. I'm talk about that. So yeah. that's one of the things that, one of the other things that we don't do. So. If you look at our CP 250s, the, the cooling system is pretty much a progression of what we work there. The same as power module. We have a liquid cool system that there is no there is no compressor, there is no chiller. Right. Okay. It's just a radiator, just like a you can see the radiator and the fans on it. Yeah. You can see the fans or modular actually. You can we can lose up to you know two two or three of those fans and it's still run full power. And you have filters that go in front of those. There is no filter. I know. Really, so, it's amazing. So the, if you if you look at the top section, that's what we call a wet zone. Okay. There's no filtering. You just, uh, it's completely exposed to the ambient environment. The rain can come in. It's like a vehicle. You don't have a filter in front of yeah, the radiator. Sure. Yeah. So that's the same concept. Ah, so you smart. don't need to uh, service the product, you know, with the filters. A lot of air cooled system, majority of the yeah. EV charges are air cooled. Imagine yes. all that humidity that comes in, the salts and the yeah. chemicals. So that's going to impact the lifetime of the product. The, if, everything beyond this top section, what we call a dry zone. Mm -hmm. Even though this is sealed, it's still all the electronics and everything. So it's not going to see any uh, ambient air transaction with the outside world. We have a liquid to air heat exchanger that actually cools this cabinet down to the same to the same cooling system we have in the system. That's so smart. I can only think of maybe one other unit on the market that's sealed like this. I mean, it's pretty. That's next yes. level stuff. 
So you open a Dispower module after five years, it looks pristine, brand new. Amazing. And then really the only risk of humidity in there, I, ass I assume you have sensors to monitor humidity. We have humidity sensors. Yeah. So, yeah. But so it's when the user or the, the service tech opens this up, that yes. would be your only risk. Only risk. And it's gonna, again, that's why we have the second layer, right? We have first layer and the second layer. Of, and then we have mitigation factors for the, to manage the, to manage the humidity. Right. Um, there are 100 plus sensors in the unit that we monitor. Um, continuously inside this uh, inside the power module we have any any magnetics any capacitor any semiconductor de device is being monitored constantly wow. we, we we know what the lifetime of the product they actually predict the lifetime we know how many cycles the power module do we have all the history of that wow so you can do predictive replacement you know 10 years down the line from now or 15 years whenever it comes that up correct so we can have predictive uh, algorithms running and knowing what is going on with the with the product. And then this, maybe one day these will be 60 kilowatt bricks or whatever comes next. Yes. And you can just swap those that's out. That's correct. So that's that's going to be the philosophy. We are, we are going to continue supporting the product for its lifetime. You can see our CP250s are out there, it's still out there, and they're going to run. Yeah. And anything that we do uh, and upgrade, let's say the power module was, you know, some of the components were discontinued. The new one that we designed is going to just go, um, you know, it's you can retrofit the units on there. Right, run they'll just run just pretty much forever. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Wow, yeah. that's so, amazing. Didn't realize these were sealed. Um, and really smart that you don't have to chill the sub ambient because that adds a whole nother level yes. of complexity. Yes. So you can see actually the cooling system a little bit, you know, it's similar to the CP250s. Obviously, you have a little bit bigger pump, bigger radiator, bigger tank. But, uh, and then that same concept goes to liquid cool cable. Mm. We don't chill our, you know, um, cables uh, it's it's just use the ambient air to um to cool the cable down oh, well that's also smart and our viewers will know yes. like 75 percent of our cable issues are because the chillers fail that's correct so um some of them are oil oil cooled we, we are yep. water cooled base again the, the the progression has been water cooled mm -hmm. we have been able to make it work with the with the with the water cooled system very cool. even when it comes to cable and you're obviously using a cable from a supplier but with your own cooling package yes we don't be designed Yes, our own cooling system. So you're not buying the cooling system from the cable, That's which is correct. how most people out there do That's it. Correct. And then they can't get parts to fix yes. them and it's a pain in the butt. So this is really smart. The other thing that that enables us to do is if you, I'm sure you've seen those those manufacturers, their dispensers require to bring in another, to, you know, AC cable power in. Right, of course. Because yes. it's kilowatts of power to run yes. a chiller. To and then they have to run a separate down. conduit underneath so for AC. What yeah. we have done is that we didn't want to run any AC to our product, so only DC comes into it. Oh, really? We have a, behind this, there's a there's a large power supply that it's a, it, it powers from the grid uh, to 48 volt DC. That powers okay. everything inside the power block and we can run that up to eight dispensers and powers the electronics and up to two liquid cooled cable dispensers very cool Obviously, so you need some more power so it comes with the ethernet cable and the same conduit it comes to the system and runs the runs the power fascinating because even just finding you know 48 volt dc pumps and stuff like this that can't be easy it's all our design so oh it's work, your design we Amazing. Work with our, yeah with, with the vendors to kind of it's all this we we'll spec it out because i've spent a lot of time designing components that you know, again, we design a platform. We don't bolt things together from different yeah. manufacturers. Even the power supplies, we don't buy off the shelf. It's all our design. It's amazing. I mean, that's that's the way to succeed in this yes. business. I mean, so, yeah. crazy stuff. There's yeah. Just having that, like, I, maybe some of our viewers will know, and they're just like, jaws are dropped right now. Mine, <laughs> mine, I'm, obviously, this is impressive. But just um, like you were saying, the, the downside of having to have a AC line run to most dispensers to run the cable cooling, run the screen, run the cell right. SIM card, or whatever's going on in there, uh, that is fascinating that everything here is low voltage DC. Absolutely. And again, the, the amount of power we need to cool a cable down is just, I can't name, I say numbers right now, but it's a lot lower than anything out there. Certainly, especially because you're not chilling. Yes. Yeah, so yes. that helps a lot. But you can run, you have temperature monitoring in the cable and the handle and the, the output yes. as well? Yeah, contacts, the, the cables. The connections on the top we have multiple temperature sensors and have you been able to smoke one yet have you been able to derate one or the car's charging curves die before we the actually put this in chamber up to 50 degrees c so we yeah okay. we get to a point after running for hours that you start kind of derating and yeah. we have a very sophisticated close to control okay. that make sure the contact temperature always stays below but it, but right it before it fuses to the car that's correct yeah. so that's yeah. the most important one that we have a lot of safety features around that actually so yeah very to make cool. sure that's never going to exceed so oh, that's fascinating and then you saw our dispensers out there i just want to talk a little bit on that 
um, our dispenser is one design. It, it, might, it might look different in the outside world, but if you see the, the, the middle section, there's a, there's a kind of cutout here. Yeah, yeah. So we have what we call a pedestal and the head units. This is what you saw out there in the, in the uh, mounted in the gantry on the wall mount. Right, yep. And the, the, we put the pedestal for the ground mount and all the connection goes there. So it's, it's, you know, if you think about it on the power block and power module, all of our focus has been serviceability, reliability, uptime. On the dispenser, it's all about configurability and what that's what that you have the, the most option to do um, any combination of cables and um, mountings that you know the customer needs. You can buy the same parts, put them in somewhere in the inventory, and decide in elastic and what do you want a Chidemo cable? Do you want a CCS cable? Do you sure. want a wall mount? Do you want a gantry mount? Amazing. And then you can put them together. So the cables. I want to talk, touch on the cables because it's very important. Our cables are what we call a smart cables. So we have actually electronics built into the cables. So okay. I'll show you an example of that. Yeah. Uh, so the, the logic to talk to the, cable, uh, to the vehicle you know, and the protocol is built into the cable. The controller, you know, it's just it's a controller. Certainly. So you can, you can start with having, let's say, two CCS ones and decide, oh, I want to them one later. Yeah. And we can offer it. Just unplugs and plugs the Chalemo. And do you have like you know I've seen some of those control boards that are on the top of certain cables. Yes. Is that similar to like what you have up here? Yeah, I'll show you one on the AC side. This okay. is harder to see, but I will show it to you. Yeah. And then and then this is a this can be a dry cable. It can be and then we what we call a backpack with bolt on that has the cooling system embedded into it. Oh, interesting. So then it converts so with versions. Yeah. So it's the same same chassis, same same. A lot of components are similar. We yeah. just we can we have options that Modular, we bolt on, on and then we can make a liquid cooker 250 amp 350 amp the dispenser is designed for two times 500 amp eventually it's going to support up to a thousand amp megawatt charger sure cable so the platform is already there so pat platforms way overbuilt from way what overbuilt. we're seeing so, yeah out we the are public. seeing yeah. Way, way you know down the road we should be fine with this with this hardware very cool we are just going to continue going to evolve it and what was the the reasoning just out of curiosity, when when we see CP two fifties out there with the two hundred amp cables, what was that decision to say? Let's go two hundred. Was it an average of what most cars could take, or what what was that uh, decision like? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's a cable technology. I mean, the cable technology wasn't there. The cable the cables are catching up, you know, sure. gradually. With the, it's all about the you know what cable is provided, what what is listed. Uh, you know, obviously they have to be UN listed. Right. So we kind of follow that trend of, you know, the cable availability right. and also the cars, right? So you can, you can over design right now for, for high power, but if some, if the cars can't support it, right. you know, are the people willing to pay for that right now? Or, or what we have done is that we have, we have a platform where you can increase your power if you want. So you just have to have your infrastructure supported. They start with one power block, 200 kilowatt, 100 to 1000 volts. 500 amp and then increase it to 400 600 it goes to a megawatt right and then you can install a dispenser today it starts with however much to, let's say 250 250 amp cable you yep. you want the liquid cool cable later decide you want a thousand amp later so it, it has it ha it gives the, the the users or the our customers the opportunity to kind of evolve with the, with the industry right? so basically let's say you know our you know you, you have obviously cost is always the driving factor if yes. everyone had unlimited money we'd have megawatt chargers everywhere but right. not the case um uh, someone you know a site host can purchase this unit um you know let's say it's an express plus they can basically get a 350 amp air-cooled cable and then you know two years down the line they're like hey we're seeing a lot of 500 amp capable cars charging yes. here um you know they can then swap that cable out Put a new one on with the backpack cooling system. That's correct, and they're good to go. That's correct. So That's right now we're encouraging uh, our customers, you know, to run the infrastructure for the 500 amp. Okay. So then they can start there, but everything is there. You just have to upgrade the system, or you know, change the cable, or whatever you have to do to yeah. the unit to upgrade to higher power. That's amazing. I think the only real downside to this, um, you know, sort of having multiple power outputs per post is just that question mark when a user rolls up to the station. Obviously, they can check in their app. If their car is connected, they can see the maximum power. Sometimes we've seen some communication, weird things happen where the cars display the wrong power and it'll show like 500 kilowatts. I'm like, eh, I don't <laughs> think my Rivian's getting 500 kilowatts. Um, you know, that that's really uh, where the screen can maybe come in handy, yes. where you can maybe, my suggestion would be to make the power output bigger. 
just so people can know the maximum this charger can do. Because the same charger could output 40 kilowatts or you know 350 right, and have right. that same faceplate. Right. We usually kind of show the available power, but yeah, I think yeah, from Tekken, I think we have to we have to do that. Yeah, cool. No, this is so impressive. This right. is really so, cool stuff. So yeah, the same thing you saw that. So the two DC output comes out here. If, for example, we have two of these, we, we encourage to kind of crisscross the, 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 the outputs. So you have redundancy, we create redundancy by... Oh, interesting. So if, if, you know, even if you have one power left on, you always can serve both, both dispensers. Oh, really? So, so if one whole unit goes down, you can... There's very kind of routings. We have configurations for the site designs that helps you to have redundancy. It's right. all, you know, we want, we want the cars to charge. We don't want the car to show up and not be able to charge. Sure, of No course. matter what the problem is. Imagine yeah. the breaker is tripped for some reason. Yeah. But you don't want to, you know, if you have two power blocks, you should be able to run. You should be able to charge both dispensers. Yeah, some sort of site them. level power shifting, if yes. you will. Yeah, yes. no, that's great. We that's manage great. all of that. Um, I think we can just move to the other side so I can talk about. Uh, so the philosophy of the modular, I want to make sure it goes everywhere, right? That's our controller, the one that we talked about. This goes in our AC and DC props. Right, same screen. It has RFID, Bluetooth, wireless, uh, LTE modem, uh, camera. So this houses everything and it's low voltage DC. That's correct. But can it also run AC? Uh, you mean in terms For of the, the level yeah, two stations? It's the same, same controller also, yep. it's actually that goes in there. Yep, so it can be uh, powered both ways then? This this actually is, uh, no, it's a 48 volt DC. Oh, so okay. That, that is, yeah, the, the power comes from the AUX power supply. Oh, I see, system. okay, makes sense. And on that actually we have power supply built into the, the AC module, which I'll show it to you. Okay, But great. this is the heart of our unit, the, the, the kind of brain of our units. Yeah. All the communication, everything happens with this one, with this uh, controller. Yeah, very um, cool. And then the, the, power, the power path inside our dispensers, the same yeah. thing. You can see it's another module. Uh, this is a 500 amp path with all the protection, uh, you know, surveillance relays, uh, built into it isolation monitoring whatever that is required and also it's a meter it complies with the metering requirements for north america and europe so is it ctep compliant for CTEP california compliant. yeah, yeah. Cool. ctep compliance and also the mid equipped in the future for the for the europe and the meter is measured obviously just before the cable output yes we have to make sure yes it is yeah. What is delivered to the vehicle? Actually, we have compensation factors even for the cable. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, we, can, we can charge. We can charge for the losses of the cable. Right. Interesting. We charge for the power that goes to the. Vehicle. So you're you're charging for literally right at the end of that kind That's of that right. connection yes. because we've started to see and I'm starting to do some testing out there. Um, I've seen like 12 percent deviation from what's actually coming out of the cable yes. to what we're being built yes. for which is massive when you yes. multiply that across. So this is really cool. Yeah. They, is there an easy way for uh, you know a compliance agency to actually measure the amount of power, like roll a mobile unit to certify yeah. something? Actually, you saw that you started in Europe, especially in Germany, there's a requirement called iCrypt. Yeah, yeah. They, they do that. They actually, we have to provide, and I'll show it to you, means for them to actually test the units and i'll show you how oh great so yeah, yeah and it's coming to pretty much that's going to expand to all europe and i i know that there's something getting worked for the um north america too yeah very cool no this is fascinating so yeah so i th think about right you know our, you saw our fan trays you saw these modules and imagine your spare parts that you have to if you have multiple dc you know the stations running across the north america and europe yeah. you you need the same same exact spare parts but that's really great because it allows you to put in the charger configuration that's right for every particular install which might be different and it's just the same stuff that's correct that's really cool and then the same units that you see here no 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 changes both of them it goes in north america and europe so that unit operates all the way down to 400 volt ac Oh yeah, and goes to four hundred eighty volt AC. Yeah, wow. Uh, one one unit, no changes at all. So the same unit goes through Europe, and that's fascinating. Yeah, domestic. and we comply with both um, requirements. Wow, really cool stuff. This is all all pretty genius, if you ask yes. me. I mean, the, I guess the best way to describe it from from my perspective, I mean, our audience, are, a lot of them are familiar with cars. We we've, we've seen certain automakers take like a very vertically integrated from the module, the cabling, everything's in house, and honestly, that's proven to work best. Yes, and there's no question that you know you get in one of those vehicles, whether it's Rivian or Tesla, and like everything works perfectly. The updates go really well. And then you see automakers that are you know more traditional that are taking from this supplier, that supplier and it gets convoluted and the updates suck. Uh, this is very much the, uh, 
the, the the better approach. I've never seen a charging company do anything like this. Do you know of, I mean, I know you probably can't say, but like, this is really unique, isn't it? It is very unique, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's what uh, our CEO believes and has been pushing and, uh, you know, it, it's paid off. I mean, it's, it works really well for us and it focuses our efforts, right? Our design efforts are focused and we can, we can improve these elements, you know, continuously and it's you know it's going to translate into old products or the new products fascinating stuff thank you so much for no problem. Making us this is the one that you know this is another homemade uh, uh ev emulators oh really this cool. is a non it's a for lab it's non-portable yeah yeah oh very cool so you could basically program this to act as any electric car that you'd yes. snip their sequence yes. and and do io testing with it yes yes that's very cool yeah so let's go down i want to show you something on the So you can see this one, that is inside of the, the our uh, power link with two times 500 amp. Oh, so this is so Express it's... Plus tool 500 amp power. So that, that unit is just inside of it. Yep. Um, so again, designed for serviceability, yeah. everything's modular, everything's keyed so a technician can't put it in the wrong way. Right, wow. Yeah, fascinating stuff. And yet you can see exactly the mirrors and everything all in that yes. uh, one package, which is really sweet. Which brings me to what I was talking about. So this is our AC module. This, the same display that we saw that there, right? That that is uh, kind of get, gets installed on both AC and DC products. And um, the, my question for this is: so obviously this can go up to 80 amp output. Yes. Most of them that we'll see probably 50 amps will be out there. But can it do dual 80 amp output? Dual 80 amp. Dual. So that so you basically do two 100 amp connections into the unit, yes. and it's all done on board. On board. So. Yeah. That's a, this is our AC module, we call that. This uh, is designed, it's one module. It's certified as a meter in Europe. Oh, interesting. And North America, you can see actually it has built-in um, display. And you were, you were asking, what do they do at the site? They come to the site, they roll this up, they have an equipment, plug the car, start the charge. And they, they actually, there's a counter here. They actually, they have an equipment that put there to, to count the, the pulses. Oh, really? And we match that to the amount of, uh, you know, charge that kilowatt hour charge that is going down to make sure it's still accurate. Wow, so that's they crazy. Do, they do, you know, they drop by and do the inspections. So, it, it, you know, so, and then the cable that I was talking about, the smarts in the cable, imagine, you know, as you know, I mean, majority of the problems in the field is with the cables, right? The cables get damaged because they handle it. You know. Of course, yes. And then so, we have designed this to be modular. You can actually <laughs> no way. This ship separately is is all connectorized, all designed with all the electronics in here. That just snaps on. It snaps out. You just you know you put 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 it back in, and then there's a bolt there. You connect it, and you it can walk away. And how many amps can you go to with this type of connection? So this one, actually, this is a three phase, a slash single phase for North America and Europe. Okay. So it's yep. the same module. There's a there's a panel down here. Yeah. It actually changes depending on the North really? America and Europe. And then when the AC module plugs into it, it actually detects if it's a single phase, three <laughs> phase. So it does 80 amp, two times 80 amp, or two times... Uh, three 30, times 16. Yeah, yeah, 32 amp. Third, oh, three times three 32. 32. Yeah. Yes. yeah, wow, very cool. So we're as proud of the inside as we are the outside. Yeah. And everything's intentional, right? And so you've seen, historically, we've always had an aluminum ribbed design that carries from our AC products to our DC products. We do that intentionally too. We do that because it's less attractive for taggers. Their artwork doesn't show up as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, the design of the cable is because, you know, that is one of the more vulnerable parts that sometimes we can't control what happens, but we want a real easy remedy to get it back up online uh, very swiftly. What you see also is a design on the outside that you see common design themes. Now you're seeing better queuing when you enter the parking lot, whether it's green or blue. Yeah, that's really great. And that carries over to what we do on the DC side as well. The gesture touch, now this isn't a live display, but in our live displays, with just the movement of my finger, I can control that display. So if it's iced over, if it's raining, if I have gloves on, that's why we put all the thought into these experiences. This is a larger screen than we've uh, historically shipped in North America. And we think it's really important so that retailers can explain to their consumers you know, how it might tie into the loyalty program. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, you can customize the screen for whoever's purchasing the unit. Uh, we can, and uh, they often want to customize the skins as well, those orange areas on the product. Right. But if you're in a workplace and you're holding those stations uh, under a wait list, 
and you're queuing your drivers in to when they can access that particular station, that's another purpose for, this, for the screen. And of course, displaying the price that's available to you. Amazing, very cool stuff. Love that everything's modular. Then that I've never seen a cable connect like that before. <laughs> That's really cool. The same concept actually is applies to our DC too. You can see the DC cable. Yeah, check that, that out. Look, so that, that that has the same philosophy. You can see on that uh, that section, the board is actually is inside with the LEDs. Yeah. So that whole thing comes off. You just remove that cover. The cables come off. You can wow. connect a brand new cable on it. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's all about scalability. It's about reliability. The growth of this industry is enormous over the next decade. Certainly. Um, and we've designed this from a architecture to maintain that, up, maintain that uptime, but also to maintain that scalability from a supply chain standpoint. Yeah, just, yeah, pretty incredible stuff. This yes. is really cool. Can we uh, can we plug in a car and so, yes, show how that all works? Yes, yes. Well, now you join us back outside where all of that technology we just saw in the lab, really crazy stuff. Ultimately, ChargePoint tries to take all of that complexity, even though they do it all in-house, it's all amazing, and just make it a super simple user experience to charge a car. So can you walk us through what someone would actually do? I know a lot of our audience are EV drivers and have done this, but how, how would you suggest someone charge their car? Yeah, so as far as the user experience goes, you know, when I pull up to a site, I mean, I drive electric and get out of my car. The first thing I do is I wanna walk up to the station and authenticate. So get on my phone and I don't need to do anything. I just hold it up to the station. Get my yeah, face, face ID, ID. Yeah. <laughs> Give me one second. The card comes up automatically. If you just hold it up to the station, it picks out your charge point card. Double click, get face ID to work. I felt my phone buzz. Yep, there it goes, it says plug in. It says plug in. Let and this in. is a full 500 amp unit 500 right amp. here. Liquid cooled, not chilled, but just liquid cooled. And we're plugging okay. into this EQE, which does require full 500 amps because it's at such low voltage, this battery pack. Now the car may not be preconditioned or anything, right? So I don't know what's going on there, but yeah. it's gonna take a second to authenticate. Right, Wait so slack me. test, handshake, everything's going through, communications. And uh, yep, should start here in just a moment. Charging, very good. And there we are, ramping up the power. We're at 26% state of charge. You can hear. Yep, a little bit of fans going on in the background. The power start to go there, so it's starting slow. Battery's probably. Yep, here we, we go. It's just ramping up, 30 kilowatts and ramping. So those fans, that's the cable cooling fans. So you're hearing a couple different things. There's noise you might hear in here. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the cable cooling. But most of what you're hearing that's very quiet. Most of what you're probably hearing is back here in the power block. Yeah. So there's the cooling that's ramping up there. Um, and you saw that in the lab. Yep. Very cool. So now we know what the fans are actually doing. And here we are ramping, still just going pretty slow. We're at 70 kilowatts or so. Again, battery could be really cold on this thing, but, but nope, we are ramping up. Very cool to see this work. I mean, we do this all the time, but yeah, yeah. you know, for some viewers, it's literally just tap a card and plug in yeah. and uh, plug in charge, maybe coming down the road. Yep. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> it should be interesting. So one cool thing about the Mercedes products is if you have an AMG model, it will actually tell you battery temperature average at least. So you can see here, we're just on the cold side. And so the car is not getting its full 500 amps, but typically it would, uh, once the battery's preconditioned and warmed up, it would go, but we're getting 396 amps or so. This is from the battery pack. So the charger is probably delivering slightly more and then with some losses. If we come over here to the actual charging screen, you can see it says we're getting 140 kilowatts and as the battery warms and the curve starts to taper, that actually might hold steady for a little while, but love to see all the tech in here. And, and uh, especially if you get an AMG EQ model, at least the little trick is you go to the AMG performance screen and that gives you all the nerdy data that you could want in terms of your temperature. So love to see that. We're actually just down the street and I'm with my new friend, Amir. How's it going, sir? It's going great. Happy to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Can you, uh, well, what the heck are we going to see here, first of all? Today, we're going to see how we make our charging systems as reliable as possible to meet all those customer expectations out in the field. So this is where you do hardcore testing of the equipment that was designed and engineered elsewhere. Correct. We do limit testing. We do long-term stress testing. Uh, we do validation testing. Uh, basically full scope and some regulatory testing also happens here safety focused testing cool explosion testing explosion testing it's, <laughs> yeah. it's more it's more actually 
uh, the key the key style of testing is to represent what's going to happen in the field. Of course, but, you know, in some cases you are going to the limits to see what happens, what, yeah. what can go wrong. Well, I can't thank you enough for having us. This is really great. Can't wait to show the viewers what you guys are up to. But um, yeah, what what do you have here? This looks pretty neat. Yeah. Um, so one of the, what I wanted to share with you today is that our work here doesn't start and stop with the testing, and testing is a big part of what we do. Uh, but there's a lot of upfront reliability analysis done early phase in the product development uh, where we're trying to implement design for reliability practices. And that surrounds component selection, material selection, governing the design before you even have a physical product towards reliability from best practices, from predecessor product learnings, from the field, um, what we know is going to happen to the system and what operating conditions are going to be stressful for long term. So we can govern all of that and align cross-functionally early on to make sure um, that the, the stage is set essentially for a reliable product. And then we're entering prototype phases where we're setting clear requirements for target lifetime, target failure rates, and doing risk analysis to identify all the possible failure modes that might occur. And that again, uh, sets the roadmap for all the upcoming validation work, all the upcoming stress specifications that we set for the product um, that then uh, guides the rigorous uh, validation work that happens in some of these phases. So this very busy table shows uh, the range of uh, practices that we follow early phase here, and then we have the XDT phase uh, where we're doing all that heavy testing, and it's an iterative process. So when we apply those test specifications, if we find the hardware issue, we want to really understand the physics behind the, the potential issue, uh, guide corrective actions, and then actually go rebuild, retest, and validate that the issue is mitigated. And so we'll iterate until we've met all those early requirements, in which case we're ready to ship a product out in the field. And the work actually doesn't end there because we want to keep monitoring the product's performance in field make adjustments, make improvements. You can never have 100% reliability, um, despite all the upfront rigorous development work. Uh, and along the way, if anything changes in supply chain, if anything changes in the, in the manufacturing process or small design tweaks, we have to go back and reevaluate the process that we ran during the development cycle and see if any of those testing specifications or uh, simulation practices or estimation uh, by model would have to be repeated. And the goal is to make sure uh, the product stays reliable if changes are made during mass production. Very cool. I mean, I think that's, you know, such a huge topic for our audience are the EV drivers using your equipment and, you know, just seeing what, what they're going to go through today, hopefully will help build even more confidence with charge point equipment. One of the sayings we always have is like, if you see a, a CPE 250 out there, you know, you're always going to get a charge. I mean, they're very high reliability in our, in our testing and our, you know, feedback from our users, our viewers taking a look at our, our videos and our rate your charge updates. CP 250s just rock and your AC equipment of course is right up there as well as some of the best in the industry so really looking forward to seeing what happens here excellent um, so yeah and uh, a lot of the testing we'll see today is focused on characterizing those uh, cumulative stress scenarios in the field so a lot of testing that we'll do is commonly called waterfall testing where each test unit will go through a sequence of tests um, that combine the stresses that might bring out some of those issues that we theorize could be a problem for the hardware to demonstrate do we have that risk or do we not? Um, and it'll be a combination of operational stress, mechanical stress, environmental stress, and we'll put several units through the, actually the same test because you might have a perfect design that meets all those requirements, but what about unit to unit variation because of manufacturing process or materials quality? All of that could cause fall out in the field and we want to make sure we capture the full spectrum. Makes total sense. That's really great stuff. Awesome. So um, yeah, without further ado, we should go in the lab and check out some of the test steps. All right, let's do it. We all got our suits on, so we're ready to rock and roll. All right. So the facility actually used to be a UL facility uh, test site. And since we've acquired the building, we've scaled it up significantly because we're doing that volume testing. We're putting over 3,300 units, test units, through the lab every single year, 10,000 charge sessions. So there's been a lot of infrastructure scaling up to support all that. Wow, very cool. So we take a, take a walk in here. Um, as you walk through, you'll see all kinds of test units. You'll see systems, 
components like these these fans you'll see sub assemblies cable cable assemblies pcpas um, so one of those key test categories is the operational stress test um, and that that takes in the, on the concept of having an automated script that exercises all the functions of the system at the worst case stress conditions, also in a hot ambient. So um, behind that orange wall, we're doing that for our Express Plus systems with uh, high power output. Uh, and all these units on the outside simulate what a car does essentially and load up the system take in that charge and circulate it back. Actually, it's regenerative, so we're- Regenerative we're, uh, load bank yeah, systems, right. yep. So that's commonly used in the industry. Yep. Um, and if there are- How many kilowatts can each one of these do, by the way? 100 kilowatts. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Right. Okay. So, and you can pair them up, so you can link as many as you need to support higher, higher power products. And then really all you're doing is just paying for the losses in oh, terms yeah. of electricity. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so, so that's really great see all that regenerative um, load yeah bank. and so if there are other functions in the system besides just charge output we will exercise those as well so wi-fi connectivity bluetooth connect connectivity we will um, have leds on at max brightness cycling through the lights actually if we go in the back we'll, i'll show you cp6000 oh yeah now. great and and just to have to show our viewers this right here what what is going on here this is crazy yeah so any product that has moving parts will need mechanical cycling of those moving parts through whatever your estimation of lifetime cycles is. Connectors, we all know those are going to get plugged and unplugged from a car and the plastic holsters on a system thousands of times on the DC side, over 100,000 times in a lifetime. So you have to run units through those. And so all of our cycle testers are homegrown. You can't really buy those cycle testers off the shelf. Um, and they'll go through a variety of different test setups. Wow, that is so cool. And I can see you have some cable management testing over here as yes, well. Yes, we do. And so one other thing point to make about the, the charge connectors is, uh, again, remember that sequence testing. So they'll go through dust exposure, they'll go through rain exposure, thermal exposure, and then come back to cycling, do a drop test, come back to cycling. It will accumulate that stress the way it would happen when sitting out in the parking lot. Right, that's really cool to hear. That's right. pretty amazing. So yeah, this is a pretty cool setup. Uh, actually, all these are live tests that are running for actual product testing. Um, and so this simulates a scenario when the cable doesn't reach the car and the user doesn't know, so they will put that extra force on the cord. Oh, interesting. And you know, this is a key demonstration because if we don't understand how much force a user will put on that cord, we have to characterize it. We don't want to guess. So we'll run a user study out in the parking lot, and we did for this test spec development. Uh, where we'll put a force gauge in line and we'll set the car intentionally far enough where it doesn't reach. We'll put uh, a number of users through that and measure. And we're testing for the high percentile case, actually, not the average user. Right. We're going to test for 90th percentile and above, and that will cover all the more average users. Very cool. That is pretty amazing. I mean, I can't think of anyone else that's doing this much effort into uh, cable management, making sure they work. I, and, I, and I really think it's essential uh, to run this type of custom testing if you don't want to run into surprises when you have your units out on the field. Absolutely. Oh, wow. This is this is all like eye candy all through here. It's just crazy. <laughs> so yeah, that concept I mentioned about operational stress, it's really cool with CP6000 because you've got all the lights. So you get a visual demonstration of what's going on. Oh, dang. You can see you have European style units on the, on the right and North American protocol on the left. They're cycling independently through the lights. Displays are max brightness. Wi-Fi is getting data package uh, stress testing happening, and of course, charge output. So, so you're just maxing these suckers out. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> around the clock. So these will run automated. Even the even the volume uh, on the chimes is turned up to exercise those as well. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So yeah, just jamming them with network connections, with charging output, and very cool to see. And you can sense the room is hot. Yeah, it it's is. Hot. It's so, toasty. So when the doors are closed and we're running uh, continuously, this room can get up to 50 Celsius. Oh, wow. That's the limit operate, operates. Yeah. Condition. So that can get real toasty in there. Yeah. And what we're essentially doing is speeding up the wear in the field with our test environment. And are you finding any issues so far? Or what? what how's that process going with the 6,000? Yeah. So we're, we're quite far in the development cycle for the 6,000. And we found 
uh, a plethora of issues that we've addressed and iterated on and revalidated by this phase. So, Amazing. Um, the product is is near the end of the line and, and ready. Ready to go pretty close to. Right. Yeah, that must be a cool process to uh, to witness and be a part of to basically you know get the first iterations from prototyping, see faults, get them back a few months later and yeah, that's nothing. Very cool. Thanks and, for showing us this. Yeah, the learnings from the hardware we share across all of our products because all of our reliability team works on, each person works on a number of products. So we sit next to each other and the learnings get shared across the board um, on the components used and shared and the operating conditions that are, that are shared between the products. Amazing. Amazing. Very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Thanks. All right. So let's get on that. So next up, I want to show you a few more environmental exposure stress tests. So you have a solar radiation test in here. So you named it. This is an obvious one. Um, sun exposure, and this is an unavoidable uh, case. And in areas that are really aggressive, like Arizona, when you have hot ambience plus solar loading, you're going to get a multiplied effect on the, the temperature rises on your components. Yes. Which can be aggressive and can shorten the lifetime of those, uh, of that hardware. Um, certain components have sensitivities, even a couple of degrees different, uh, difference over many years could actually reduce that lifetime. Um, so as a case example, you'll see a number of our systems with all these wires coming off of them. Each wire is a temperature sensor. Uh, so we're studying all the suspected high temperature points and sensitive components and we're running through iterations to try and improve the thermal management of the system. Uh, we actually took this setup, we sent it over to Arizona in the worst case conditions that we were matching within a couple degrees. So this setup is very representative of what happens in the field, but we also have the option to accelerate the stress. The system can go up to double the intensity of the sun. Um, that allows us to speed up that wear rate. That's um, cool. That is actually, really if I shut cool. off the lights, we can go take a peek inside. These windows had five layers of tint, so it's super bright. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was gonna say already, now we just see ourselves through here. <laughs> right, yeah, so if you take a peek inside, you'll see our state-of-the-art solar simulator system. Oh, the wow, yeah, is hot, yeah. The ambient's hot, and so that all this, the glass that's on these lamps, simu uh, the filtered glass, um, allows the output to be represented on the sun spectrum. Wow, it is so hot in here. <laughs> it is very hot, yes. So again, hot ambient, solar loading, so the surfaces can get much hotter. Imagine the dash of a car, get up to 85 Celsius or more. Uh, and that can be problematic because the, the there can be a temperature gradient down to components, especially on the front module here. Sure. Um, and those can get into dangerous temperatures and we have to manage that with Rating, we have to manage that with uh, thermal design on the mechanical side yep. um, to keep those temperatures in check. Very, very cool to see. Uh, just so many temperature sensors going all over the place. Yeah. It's pretty okay. amazing. Our thermal engineers are very conservative and very uh, data hungry. So Yeah, <laughs> so they just measure everything. Absolutely. <laughs> amazing. Let's not trip on any of that. Yes, right. Very cool. I'll close that up. So if we take a turn around the corner. Oh, check this out. Another obvious and unavoidable one, water exposure. So you have scenarios like heavy rain, uh, pressure washing, especially in European settings, multi-directional, right? Um, and uh, heavy storms where you have multi-directional high jets of water hitting the system. You mentioned European uh, pressure washing. What's what's that about? Uh, so. Uh, pressure washing, I mean, when... when oh, like cleanings are going yeah, out? When, okay. when it's yeah. out on the sidewalk, there's going to be pressure washing. Interesting, And yeah. so, has to hold up against that. And some of the specs that we're validating against represent that, like, all of our systems are rated up to IPX6, representing those high jet water scenarios. Wow. Um, and flooding, and flood scenarios up to 18 inches of, of a floodplain. The system should be able to sit in water and charge safely and reliably. Wow, very, very cool. And uh, yeah, this is just a cool setup that you have here. That's yeah, awesome. Right. Just like pour some water on it. <laughs> yeah, and, and notice the system is on. And in, in actually, this is a demo. 
Uh, but in a full test, you will have power output. That's how it's going to happen in the field. Oh, so we might find certain issues in that scenario that just sitting benign won't bring out. Um, and another key point is going back to that sequence testing. At time zero with a brand new system, it'll pass with flying colors. But what happens when the seals have been worn over time with temperature cycles? Year five, year eight, year 10 life, uh, will water start getting into the power electronics? We have to make sure to do our due, due diligence that that isn't an issue. Right, absolutely. So, so we'll sequence this after thermal cycling, we'll sequence it after high temperature humidity tests. Um, and then you have coastal areas where you're gonna have salt exposure and salt driven corrosion. We have our salt spray chamber. Um, and that's completely, it's standalone spec. And so that's what goes on in here then? Exactly. Wow, cool. We have a hot, salty mist over a 600 hour period that brings out those weak points that are sensitive to uh, salt driven. Perfect. And do you test every charge point product in these units here? Uh, yeah, so every single product that we release first goes through a development cycle that includes some level of reliability assessment, that early phase uh, analysis as well as the testing that's involved. And each uh, product has a custom tailored set of test requirements. And even the sequencing is very custom tailored for that specific product. Makes sense, makes sense. That's really cool to hear. That's that's pretty amazing. Love that salt spray, that's pretty sick. Yeah, right. <laughs> and in, in the ideal case, um, a reliability team needs to develop test specs from the ground up. Let's say if you had no access to standards or off the shelf specifications, you should be able to characterize what your use cases are and design your tests based on physics of failure and um, model mechanisms for reliability uh, to get those specs to represent lifetime exposure. Totally, makes sense. Yep, that's great. So you see rattling in the background, that's a package vibration test we're gonna go check out. Okay, that looks cool. So every system that gets shipped out in the field is going to go through some shape or form of transportation. It's going to be on a truck, it's going to be on a plane, and actually a plane is more aggressive than a truck, take off and landing of a train, uh, of a plane. Um, so all shapes and sizes of our packaging fully as would go out in the field, goes on the vibe table and wow. experiences that vibration. That's amazing. And again, accelerates, so we're, we're representing long periods of transport in short times. Um, and so imagine a power block from our EXPP system, big, big crate on that table vibrating away. That's really, really cool. That's amazing. And so following vibration, you'll have shock scenarios where there's mishandling, heavy set down from smaller boxes. They may be dropped by the delivery guy. So they'll go through 10 orientations of drop from one meter or more, um, representing wow. those, those case scenarios. And package testing, units need to come out pristine. So we have to set careful requirements for the pass fail of all these test specs. Yeah. And yeah. when we set those requirements, each unit will go through a full verification and inspection after that stress is complete um, to identify the pro potential problem areas. Wow, very cool. That's pretty amazing. And last but not least, you have seismic events in California. Yeah. Um, so you have a Richter scale six earthquake every couple of years in California. Um, most parts of Northern California, at least. Um, so if you're representing a 10 plus year product, a test unit has to go through five plus earthquakes. Yeah, and wow. And so we'll sequence that in. And again, take charge output while that testing is happening. Right, because you'll be charging during an earthquake. Right, exactly. Yeah. You never know when it's going to hit. And um, our, our vibration system can do X, Y, and Z. And so we'll, for a seismic, we'll run through all those. So you have a profile that's given to you to simulate that and exactly. then you can run and through. we'll custom tune that profile as needed to represent the case scenarios for, for seismic. Wow, that is so cool. And Pretty amazing. The, the Richter scale eight, the catastrophic earthquakes that can come in and we have to make sure safety measures are in place in that case. That you derate, shut off charging right. or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's sensors on the system, tilt sensors, all effect sensors. So if panels come out of place or there's too much tilt in the system, it will know to shut itself off. Oh, so like if someone even backs into it while you're charging, you gotta shut off charging. Yes, correct. There, there, it does have that intelligence. Wow, that is cool. And I noticed this impact testing over here. What, yeah, what's that, going on that, with that? That's also a fun one. Uh, so the systems, uh, most of our outward fleet and uh, commercial facing systems are rated up to IK10 impact resistance, which yep. is one of the highest. Um, out of the industry. And is that why you have a little bit of distance between the screen and your, your glass plate over here? Uh, that's not the primary reason, but the, the gap does help uh, with deflection and the translation of the impact energy 
to the display and the underlying components. As you can imagine, it's a very component dense area. Yes. So um, it's not just making sure that the enclosure holds up, it's making sure that the underlying components don't get too much shock. Okay. And again, imagine going through fatigue testing and let's say uh, temperature cycling and then doing an impact test. So the, the stress can add up. Sure, sure, makes sense. Very this cool. testing is done at minus 40 Celsius, at 70 Celsius. Wow. And the materials are going to behave differently at those temperature extremes, you can imagine. Yeah, so you'll put this in a temperature chamber and run this test and over and over, yeah. basically. Right, and we'll, we'll have preconditioning um, down to that sub-zero temperature, let things stabilize, and then run the impact test. Wow, very cool. And of course, if there's any sort of compromised ingress points, we'll have to assess whether water and dust ingress are going to be an issue. Oh, fair point. That's very cool. So, so much to think about. Yeah. Uh, a typical impact is that's about a 20 joule impact. Okay. And wow. It's not too dramatic for our panels because they hold up pretty well. But again, that shock translation could could add up. Right. Over time doing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll select uh, a slew of 30 plus locations that might be risky um, or highly probable. Uh, and we'll combine that in a test plan to run on our system. <laughs> that is so cool. Thanks for showing us that. Sure. So let's take a walk this way. I see boards over here. This is so cool. Here, Cables. Right? We have some test setups that are cable focused and you can see more temperature sensors running yep. off the connectors. Um, so the connectors and the, the cable assemblies actually go through a very rigorous, dedicated test plan. All types of turf cables that we, that we ship. And, hmm. um, they will focus on uh, mechanical, again, mechanical, operational, and environmental tests. This setup here will do current cycling uh, over many cycles, and that expansion, contraction, and uh, the over current scenarios could be problematic long term. We want to make sure to test for that. Uh, and then you have all those degrees of variability and mishandling of the connector drive over scenarios, drop scenarios, all of that at sub zero temperature can be problematic. Uh, and yeah, you have impact scenario. So all of that can add up to create some some hassles for the customer. So we want to make sure we design in margin for that. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for showing us. We talked about solar. <laughs> it's but, like a um, cable dungeon in here. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so you're going to have material degradation, cosmetic degradation, uh, plastics can embrittle when you have long-term UV exposure and yeah the, the wavelengths of uv are the most aggressive for that that's why we have our solar chamber for mostly validation and thermal loading and our uv chamber is more than one we have a weathering uh, chamber as well that combines water spray that degrades that material surface coatings um, uh, see what the long-term effect might be wow so this is basically what goes on in here then yes exactly yeah. and then we go one step further because uh, there are surfaces on the product that will have contact with the user. And so there could be chemical transfer, I mean, lotions, um, sunscreen can be very aggressive for coatings and seals, uh, boils, artificial sweat. We have a bottle, a bottle of artificial sweat that we <laughs> really? tested. So That's sweat, amazing. sweat can be problematic long-term. Wow. And then cleaning, cleaning products. Sure, sure. So we might apply that to a surface and then speed up the aging with UV or uh, temperature and humidity. Stuff. Oh, that's fascinating. That is so cool. Things that, you know, a, a normal EV driver would never even think about when they right. plug in their car. Right. It's like, you've tested for it. <laughs> so yeah, we want to make sure that the experience is seamless um, from the from the beginning through the lifetime. Fascinating. Wow. And what goes on in here? Uh, a lot of temperature humidity stress, but if we go this way, sure. Um, I'll give you an overview of our chamber testing. Okay, great. So you got a bunch of these things around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my uh, goodness. First, I want to take you around the corner. Okay. Give you a uh, Dust testing. Oh, great. So Very this cool. Is probably my favorite setup in the lab, and we built this chamber ground up. Uh, it's a simple concept. It creates a dust storm over an eight hour period. Oh, wow. And so we, we are trying to do real world testing. So we're actually testing with Arizona ATU Desert Dust. Oh, which okay. It's quite fine. Um, with that desert dust, you get all the metal oxides, you get the, uh, a larger particle range that could be abrasive for contacts. It could be problematic for uh, uh, constricting your airflow uh, and causing temperature rise. Sure. And aside from uh, validating it and complying with IP ratings, which we also do in this eight president chamber, uh, 
yeah, we're doing that accumulative stress testing, as you can see. Wow. Feel free to take a peek in. Yeah. Right now it's loaded with talcum powder, which is a more benign dust, but when we're doing reliability sequences, we're doing it with desert dust. That is so freaking cool. Yeah, and, and you guys basically just built this yourselves, right? Yeah, uh, just built this. It's a simple concept. Yeah. It's a lot of work. But sure. Simple, but not easy. <laughs> and then we fine tune it to get the amount of dust accumulation and exposure that you would in like an Arizona aggressive desert. Yeah. Desert environment. Wow. I'd be really curious to see what our audience think. Leave a uh, comment down below. Uh, what do you want to see dust tested in here? <laughs> what EV component? Could be kind of fun to do a dust test video in the future. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're happy to demonstrate. Yeah, great. Uh, and behind you, you'll see a couple more examples of uh, swing arm cycling. Again, uh, every charge session is going to uh, cause a cycle on, on these swing arms. So long term, you're going to get tens of thousands of cycles. Sure. Accumulated. Wow. So that's really cool that these things basically just run flat out and you're just cycling them. Yeah. And again, think of the different case scenarios. You have nominal pulls, you have pulls that go beyond the hard stop of the of the arm and that, that could lead to different issues. So are these programmed to do a different pull every time then? Uh, yes. So we're able to program say, okay, do two pulls of nominal and then put in a pull force uh, 70 pounds beyond or 100 pounds beyond, whatever that test spec requires. Wow. Very cool. That's amazing. All right, let's take a turn around the corner. And so, what you pointed out with the environmental chambers is really important because uh, the core of reliability testing really revolves around those accelerated environmental tests. And those are ranged from high temperature, high humidity tests, 85 Celsius, 85% relative humidity, thermal cycling tests that exercise the expansion contraction fatigue mechanisms that will happen all the way down to PCBA level. Um, so we'll run those tests for hundreds of cycles, sometimes over a thousand cycles as needed for the product. Um, and every single unit, every one of those 3,300 units that will pass through the lab annually will spend some time in the chamber uh, experiencing one of these profiles, depending on what the goal for that test plan actually is. Oh, very cool. Um, we'll have forced condensation tests, freezing condensation tests, and then we'll have the full range of validation of function at the different corners of temperature and humidity. Wow, wow. And so, um, yeah, that, that includes cold temperature. So we'll take the chamber down to minus 40 Celsius, we'll run it cold, let things uh, equilibrate, and then do cold starts and demonstrate that we can actually output charge. Start up, wow, that's pretty yeah. amazing. So what, what's going on in this chamber right now? So this chamber right now has a CP280 in it. Uh, so yep, the, the next gen, yep. Next gen of CP250, and it's actually soaking at minus 40, I believe. Uh, oh, wow, very and cool. And so it is running long-term operational stress. Wow. But it's on pause at the moment, so I just want to crack open the chamber yeah. and give you a visual of how Let's aggressive that, that cold environment oh, is. Oh, amazing. Because the airflow in the, in, the, in the chamber actually creates a lot of turbulence. This is actually running. You can open it. But okay, so you know. Sure. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Dang. That's wild. <laughs> it's so cold. <laughs> Sometimes we get in the chamber to operate the unit and yeah. uh, demonstrate that it that it is doing the functions that we intend. Definitely insane. <laughs> Wow, that is crazy in there. You don't want to get locked in there. <laughs> it is like our homemade blizzard. Yeah, that's incredible. So cool. So if we uh, walk down the row, we'll see it's another example. This is on the other extreme end at the moment. So we have a liquid cooled uh, dispenser. Yep. And you can see again, a recurring theme of temperature sensors everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and running validation. So we've taken this, this system down to, again, minus 40, up to Oops, the sorry. high temperature limits, and we're running and, and studying to see what the power output's doing, what the internal sensors are telling us, what the added sensors are telling us. And you can create your own D-rate profiles based off of oh, testing in yeah, here. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that is really cool stuff. That's amazing. And so a couple examples of dust-tested units. And you can see quite a lot of dust accumulates in the contacts. So yeah. imagine doing cycle testing 
after you've accumulated that dust. Yeah, so important. Right. That is really cool. Do you find that most people in the industry or most other competitors in the industry are doing maybe every test you're doing, but individually on their components, whereas you're kind of cycling everything through everything? Sure, that's that's a great question. I do wonder. I haven't explored and been able to visit other competitor labs to say for sure. Yeah. But uh, I can just tell you that if you don't have a facility and double this level of investment, you're forced to do theoretical assessments. And like you mentioned, you're forced to push some of that testing upstream to your suppliers at component level, which doesn't capture the full picture of how it, once it's integrated in a system, because those integration points can be a common failure failure location. Totally. I mean, that's just, these are all the, the work that you're doing here leads to a much more reliable experience for EV drivers. So like each one of these tests and knowing that this charger went through dust and it's about to go through something else yes, right. is really cool. Right. And often you'll see suppliers on their own will validate their components by running single tests on single units. They may not test 20 units through the same test. We do here. Right. And we'll sequence them like you mentioned. That way, if there's a manufacturing defect or Correct. variability, you'll catch that yes. very early. Correct. But that's not to say we don't push requirements up to our suppliers to say, hey, as a prerequisite, we need you to run these stresses and qualify the parts that you're giving us on and monitor it on an ongoing basis. Sure, of so, course, of course. Makes sense. Man, so, <laughs> you have so much cool equipment in yeah, here. Yeah, and, and Kind of disguised. The you have out. x-ray machines in here? We do have x-ray machines. What, what are you x-raying? Yes. Uh, a lot of things. Uh, but I uh, think now we're going to get into the talk about forensic studies. Okay. All that failure analysis. Yep. Um, so everything we talked about and finding issues is great. But if you can't explain not only what failed, but how it failed, it limits you from being able to translate your results to what happens in the field. If it happened this fast in the test, how fast will it happen at what rate in the field? Uh, what are the potential variables you can change to add margin back in if you do run into a problem? And unless you do that deep dive physics and failure analysis, you won't be able to guide the design team and the manufacturer team to make those improvements. So that's why we've dedicated to build up a failure analysis lab in our facility, having it close to reliability and having um, expert FA engineers on the team to help with that deep dive. So wow. Wow. X-ray is a basic tool. I mean, yep. it gives us a view without um, destructing the, the evidence. Yep. Uh, so we have wow. a cross-section machine. If we take a peek inside the FA lab, we have a couple more tools. We're constantly looking for new tools to add. So we have desktop scanning electron microscope with EDS capabilities. So we'll be able to study the surface for irregularities and look for contaminants and find the sources of those contaminants. Um, and think that the PCBAs are the core of the function of the system. So if a PCBA has an issue, it's actually quite complex to find the exact root cause hmm. and failure mechanism. So if it goes through a hot and humid test, I would like to answer how the temperature and the humidity specifically cause the degradation. Not only that it failed, this component shorter. That's not that's not good enough for them. Right, right. Um, Makes sense. Makes sense. Right. And so I mentioned cross section. is a perfect example of a cross section solder joint. So you'll see there's a print uh, the um, print circuit board underneath, and you have a chipset on top. And if you have a disconnect, an open connection at a solder joint, you have to really go in and see where in that solder joint you've had your failure. Because hmm. otherwise, you won't know where in the process step to go and trying and make to make them fix. Yeah, 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 wow. So this deep dive analysis is really crucial. Uh, without it, your reliability testing doesn't have as much value. It's, this is incredible. This is every step of the way, this whole tour, has just been like raising the bar compared to anything I've seen at any company. Sure, yeah. Where'd and, you guys come up with all of these testing procedures? Uh, so some of these practices are uh, pretty standard for if you want to do full fetch reliability uh, analysis. and. Um, yeah, so we're, we're applying uh, common practices, essentially, uh, but we're just being very meticulous about it, and we really want to take a step forward to be comprehensive and capture all those use case scenarios. Yeah, um, it's amazing. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of FA strategies out there. The common one is 8D process. They say 8D process, the number 8, letter D. Yep. And it's a well-established process that actually commonly semiconductor industries use. It's very resource intensive, but it takes you in a systematic way to understand your issues and how improvements can be made. 
Wow, very cool, very cool. All right, so if we take a walk through, that's our entry lab. Great. Thanks for showing us so much cool stuff all around. Just, it's incredible. Thanks for visiting us. Yeah, no, this is great. And then even more regenerative uh, load bank systems here. Right. And so these are running the chargers that are going through the units now, right? Yes, right. So um, you have chargers in the chamber and you'll need to exercise them either for validation or long-term stress. And so you'll need these loads quite available to be able to run that power. How many of these chambers do you have? I see number 19 here. Do you oh, right. have 19 of them? Um, not quite. The numbering is a little off. Okay. Right? We have about eight of these, I call them normal sized chambers. We have two walk ins. We have a few more medium sized chambers. Um, and we're running them actually around the clock because there's so many different test specs that we're uh, requiring for the products. Are, do you find that other charging hardware manufacturers are trying to use your lab for testing as well? Uh, there have been inquiries, but <laughs> yeah. we're already overloaded, so really there isn't any room to support. Yeah, I just can't think of any other dedicated facilities that would be easily accessible for yeah. something that you can do it all under one roof. Right, yeah, and, and in the absence of uh, such a facility in-house, if you're going external, the logistics will slow you down. Right, the scheduling, the lab time, it's yeah. all crazy. And you'll struggle to run several units through a waterfall-like test of back to back to back to back. Right. Uh, scheduling is an issue, but having the team go back and forth to an external lab as opposed to walking to the chamber and doing real-time monitoring is a real limitation. Yeah. Wow, this is just mind-blowing stuff. Can't thank you enough for the tour. Perfect. This is really fascinating. And uh, now we know when we see charge point equipment out in the wild that it literally went through hell and back. Right, <laughs> and, and we really do care about the customer. We really do care about the field performance. Uh, we closely monitor the field and if there is any issue, um, we have the capability to quickly study that and iterate on the testing, do the failure analysis, and quickly get to representing that use case in our, in our testing. Wow. EV, EV charging industry is a new industry and there will be a learning curve of findings in the field. And so we're trying our best to set ourselves up to capture those learnings as efficiently as possible and feed those back into the development cycle. Well, it's really impressive stuff. So thanks again. And hopefully we'll be back soon for some more deep dives. Sounds good. It'd be great to see you on YouTube again. This was really great. Cool. We're happy to have you. And there you go. That is literally a full day at ChargePoint. I went to multiple buildings, only saw two or three of the seven massive laboratories that they have. Um, we literally used a full day of filming. So. I think I have to come back and do some more. Let me know what you guys want us to see. At the end of the day, I came in as a ChargePoint user or driver. This is not a sponsored video. This is just me coming in and experiencing with you guys. Um, and I have to say, everyone's been so open. So many viewers, like not just like they watched the channel before I came in, but they like knew specific things on interesting videos and like really followed. So amazing to see so many viewers working here. But also the fact that the way ChargePoint seems to operate, it's the way I can equate it to, it's the Tesla, it's the Apple method, it's build everything yourselves. And while it may not be the fastest hardware or the ones that, I don't know, are the sexiest, I think they're pretty cool to use, but certainly I've always, my only issue with ChargePoint has been the power. I just wanted beefier cables. They work, they're reliable, they have great software. On the back end, we didn't really talk about it much, but if you're a site host or a fleet operator, the things that you can do to manage in your drivers with your units and tie your units in with grid peaks and shaving. I mean, we can do episodes upon episodes with that stuff. It seems to me like ChargePoint's really the only ones who are tying it all together. The hardware, the software, the installation, and the maintenance and service afterwards. It, call me impressed. Uh, again, my first experience here, what a massive set of buildings that they have here. 1,800 employees. Who knew it was this big or this legit? I certainly didn't and uh, can't, can't wait to come back and see more. So a huge thanks to the ChargePoint team. Thanks to you guys for watching this very long video. Sorry to make it so long, but it just, more stuff kept coming. I literally had no idea what we were gonna do when I got here today. And um, wow, just, just fascinating. So see you all in another one soon. Bye-bye.